Its racks bulging with clothes took up a quarter of the floor space and an enormous dressing table littered with tubes, pencils and pots and overhung by a wall-sized mirror surrounded by small electrical light bulbs took up another quarter. The kitchen consisted of a stained hand basin, a minuscule geyser, a gas ring and two pots. There was one chair at the desk, a piece that looked to my half-educated eyes like a particularly beautiful Chippendale that had spent part of its recent life as a painter's stool, judging from the vari-coloured splashes across the seat and back. The only other furniture was a long sofa, taking up more than its quarter of the room and looking as if it had been hauled up from beneath a bridge somewhere, and a garish Chinese screen behind the kitchen. Behind the screen, as I might have suspected, was a water closet, gleaming new and, I soon discovered, remarkably silent. As I nosed about, I began to shed my numerous layers of disguise. The outer clothing I folded neatly to return to Watson. The mummy layers I shoved, plaster and all, into a bin of what I took to be rags behind the sofa, and the makeup joined the stains in the hand basin. My own shirt was hopelessly stuck together by the tape that Holmes had strapped on to change the set of my shoulders. But after a bit of rummaging about in the clothes racks, where I found an evening suit and tweed plus fours cheek by jowl with a linen chasuble, the brocade tunic and trousers of a Maharaja, and a stunning scarlet evening dress, I came up with a comfortable embroidered cotton dressing gown and put it on in lieu of the shirt which followed the mummy strips into the bin. In the kitchen I found a canister of tea leaves, a pot and some tins of milk, so I made tea, poured myself a cup, superb bone china, no saucer, and carried it to the dressing table. As I sipped it and sat poking through the objects in and on the table, I was struck by the extraordinary fact of the room's existence. What kind of a man would keep an entire drawer full of moustaches and beards, I thought? Or a shelf of wigs, a bushy redhead, a slicked-down black hairpiece, a woman's blonde curls, arranged on stands to resemble eerily a row of heads on pikes? Could Holmes actually honestly consider wearing that evening gown, high-necked though it was, or the... was it a sari? How many normal men had hair ribbons trailing from their chest of drawers, a collection of well-padded female undergarments, three pair of false eyelashes, two dozen old school and club ties, and a macabre cigar box filled with sets of false teeth? And even if one overlooked the reason for its existence, how did he manage it? How had he brought that sofa up here without inviting comment? And the mirror? Granted it was a large and busy building, but did no one notice the occasional unexpected noise from a supply room? The sound of running water at night? The comings and goings of odd characters? Some of them very odd indeed. What did Holmes do if, I wondered, while disguised as one of his more unsavoury characters, he were accosted and explanation of his presence demanded of him. The possibilities for comedy of the burlesque variety were greatly appealing, and several vignettes worthy of the lower classes of stage went through my mind. And, my mind continued, who had plumbed in the sink and W.C.? Who paid for the gas, the electricity, for heaven's sake? The more I thought about it, the curiouser it became. What kind of human being would need a refuge capable of sustaining life in a siege? For the plentiful, if desultory, tins of food, the two travelling rugs tossed over the sofa, three tins of pipe tobacco, a pound of coffee and the copious reading material, staid medical journals, philosophical tomes, novels with lurid covers, and brittle newspapers ancient enough to qualify as archaeology, all testified that the room's purpose was to make possible a prolonged captivity. It was quite patently not a refuge for comfort or convenience. At his height, Holmes would find the sofa a dismal night's sleep. And it was also clearly no holiday retreat. 
The threadbare line down the centre of the carpet bespoke hours spent measuring its half a dozen paces of clear space. No, there was no question in my mind. Either my friend and mentor was quite mad, a man willing to go to considerable difficulty and expense to satisfy a bizarre and romantic fantasy of paranoia, or else the life of my rustic beekeeping companion with the odd skills was extraordinarily more demanding, even dangerous, than I had fully realised. Somehow I could not think him mad. There was no doubt that the room had been recently occupied. The tea leaves were relatively fresh. The dust had not settled much onto the desk or teapot. The air, though stuffy, was not stifling and smelt faintly of tobacco. I shook my head. Even I had not suspected how very active his career still was. I wondered, not for the first time that day, nor for the last, what he was doing and how he was holding up, which brought me around to wonder what I was going to do. I could, of course, stay here until it was time to meet Holmes, and at the thought of explosive devices and flexible and imaginative would-be murderers, the bolt holes canister of tea, tins of beans and lurid novels, to say nothing of the revolver I had brought and the other one I had found in the kettle, seemed both tempting and eminently sensible. Still, there was Holmes in the streets, and Mycroft and Watson bolting for cover, and to sit in a hole with the bedclothes over my head seemed disloyal, cowardly even, illogical but true. There might well be nothing I could do, but my own self-respect demanded that I not be completely intimidated by this unknown assailant. Of course, had I known then how very flexible and imaginative our foe actually was, I should probably have stayed well hidden. But as it was, I decided defiantly to see what I could do about depleting the number of high-denomination notes that lay in my handbag on top of the gun, and went to assemble an appropriate wardrobe. By the end of four years of war, standards of dress had become markedly less demanding, and even the upper levels of society were occasionally seen in clothing that before 1914 would have been given to the maid or the church's next jumble sale. Still, it took me some time to find myself clothes among Holmes's collection. In the end, I uncovered a tweed skirt that I might tuck up to current length, and a blouse that did not look like something handed down from the butcher's wife. Stockings and suspenders I found a plenty, but I nearly gave up altogether on the shoes. Holmes's feet were larger than mine, and his selection of women's shoes somewhat limited. I held up a pair of scarlet satin sandals with four-inch heels and tried to imagine Holmes in them. My imagination failed. But if not Holmes, then who? I put them down abruptly. "'Shocked at myself. "'Keep your mind on the business at hand, please, Russell. "'I picked up a pair of dowdy black shoes "'with a strap across the instep and low Cuban heels "'and found that I could at least walk in them. "'I switched on the row of lights "'and sat down with the pots and sticks to change my face. "'How many young women had been taught "'the subtleties of make-up by a man?' "'I reflected idly. Added a long string of pearls, real, and small earrings, fake. Wrapped my head in a piece of cloth from the scarf drawer, which had, judging from the shape, once been the lining of a coat, and finally stood away from the desk to look at myself. Amazing. Nothing fit me, nothing matched, and my feet hurt already. Yet I would easily pass for a young thing out for a day in town. I darkened the rims of my spectacles with some odd brown fingernail enamel and decided reluctantly that I should have to leave them off for much of the day, as any other vain young myopic would do. I gathered up Watson's clothes, turned off the lights, took a deep breath and, with my hand inside my bag, opened the door. No bombs went off, no bullets flew, no rough hands grabbed at me. I closed the door behind me and went off to spend the money I had borrowed so shamelessly from the Holmes brothers. 
Chapter 11 Another Problem The Mutilated Four-Wheeler Ever and anon, from a sudden wave that shall be more transparent than others, there leaps forth a fact that in an instant confounds all we imagined we knew. My first task was to make a move towards reuniting Watson with his trousers. But as I made my way back through the tea room and the store's many levels, it occurred to me that Holmes's bolt hole was ideally situated, that I could easily spend the day without having to set foot on the street, for this was one of the two stores in London, I shall not mention which, as the storage room may still be in use, that touted itself as catering for needs from cradle to grave. It could certainly afford me protection, nourishment and entertainment for a single day. With that happy thought, I deposited the bundle of Watson's salvaged clothing into his black bag and left it checked, mailed the receipt to Mycroft at his club, and set off on the unfamiliar but surprisingly agreeable task of spending money. Late that afternoon, my storage room reached me downs long since vanished into the rubbish bin, my hair sculpted, my fingernails buffed and gleaming beyond all recognition, my legs encased in sheer silk stockings that were actually long enough, and my feet in heeled shoes that didn't pinch. I decided that, all things considered, the occasional dose of pampering could be great fun. I took a light and leisurely tea, assembled my multitude of parcels, which they offered to deliver and I refused, and was escorted to the door. Here I ran into a problem. Holmes had insisted that I follow the same routine as the mornings, except to take the fourth cab. But here stood the uniformed doorman and the first cab. I put on my spectacles, gave him a huge tip, and shook my head. Fifteen minutes later the third cab arrived. It was getting very dark, and at that hour few cabs were free. This one looked enticingly warm, and my new evening clothes were not. Surely Holmes had not meant to be inflexible, had he? I looked through the door at the bored driver, stepped back, and waved him on. He looked highly irritated, which matched my mood precisely. I peered down the street in one hope, studiously ignoring the doorman, when up before me pulled a very old and very battered cab drawn by one very old and battered horse. Cab, miss, said the voice from the moving anachronism. I cursed Holmes under my breath. It looked very cold in there compared to the others, but it was a cab, or it had been thirty years before, a London growler. I told the driver where I wanted to go, saw my purchases piled inside and got in. The doorman looked after me as if I was stark raving mad, which I was. I did not know London at all well then, though I had studied the maps a bit, so it took me a while to realise that we were going in the wrong direction. Not completely wrong, just very roundabout. My first thought was that the driver was pulling a swindle in order to charge me more for the ride. I had opened my mouth to call out when I froze with the terrible thought. Perhaps I had been followed. Perhaps this driver was an ally of the blind pencil seller. First I was frightened, but then I was furious. I fought the remnants of a window down and craned my neck out to see him. Oi, driver, where are you taking me? This isn't the way to Covent Garden. Yes, miss, this is the faster way. Away from the heavy traffic, miss. The voice whined obsequiously. All right, you now look. I have a revolver, and I will shoot you if you do not stop immediately. Now, miss, you doesn't want to be doing that now. He snivelled. I'm feeling more like it every moment. Stop this cab now. But I can't do that, miss. I really cannot. Why not? The shaggy head leaned over the side, and I stared up at him. "'Because we'll miss the curtain if I do,' said Holmes. "'You! You utter bastard!' 
I growled. The gun shook in my hand, and Holmes, seeing it, drew his head back quickly. Look, you, that's the second time you've played your bloody tricks on me in three days. I caught the startled looks of a passerby and lowered my voice. If you do it again, and I have a gun in my hand, I won't be responsible, do you hear? As sure as my mother's name is Mary McCarthy, I'll not be responsible for my temper. I sat back in the swaying cab and caught my breath. Several minutes later, a thin voice drifted down to me. Yes, miss. Some distance from the theatre, he pulled the ancient cab into a dark spot adjoining one of London's innumerable small and hidden parks. The growler sagged sideways with his weight, and in a moment the door fell open. He eyed me. Your mother's name was not Mary McCarthy, he said accusingly. No, it was Judith Klein. Just don't scare me again, please. I've been walking around frightened and blind since I left your brother's rooms, and I'm tired. Apologies, Russell. My twisted sense of humour has had me in trouble before this. Pax? Pax. We clasped hands firmly. He stepped up into the cab. Russell, this time it is you who must turn your back. I can hardly go into the theatre looking like the driver of a four-wheeler. I hastily departed out the other side. Coat and hat, stick and proper evening coat, hair combed, moustache applied, he alighted from the cab. A small man wandered up, whistling softly. Good evening, Billy. Evening, Mr... Evening, sir. He touched his hat to me. Don't break your neck over the boxes inside, Billy. And there's a rug under the seat if you need it. Just keep your eyes open. That I will, sir. Have a good evening, sir. Miss. I was so preoccupied that I did not notice when Holmes tucked my arm in his. Holmes, how on earth did you find me? Well, I cannot claim it was entirely a coincidence, as I thought it possible you would fall victim to the charms of the place and be there all day. Also, both the doorman and the attendant to whom you gave Watson's bag were watching and swore you hadn't yet left when I asked an hour ago. That was a slip, incidentally, Russell. You ought to have abandoned the trousers. So I see. Sorry. What did you find today? Do you know, I found absolutely nothing. Not a rumour, not a word. Nary a breath of someone moving against that old scoundrel Holmes. I must be losing my touch. Perhaps there was nothing. Perhaps. It is a most piquant problem, I must admit. I am intrigued. I am cold. So, what are we going to do now? We shall listen to the voices of angels and of men, my child, set to the music of Verdi and Puccini. And after that? After that we shall dine. And then? I fear we shall skulk back to my brother's rooms and hide behind his drapes. Oh. How is your back? Damn my back. I do wish you would stop harping on the accursed thing. If you must know, I had it serviced again this afternoon by a retired surgeon who does a good line in illegal operations and patching up my gunshot wounds. He found very little to do on it, told me to go away. And I find the topic tiresome. I was pleased to hear his mood so improved. The evening that followed was a lovely, sparkling interval, set off in my mind by what went before and what came after as a jewel set into mud. I fell asleep twice and woke with my hat in Holmes's ear, but he seemed not to notice. In fact, so carried away was he by the music that I believe he forgot I was there forgot where he was, forgot to breathe even at certain passages. I have never been a great lover of the operatic voice, but that night, I cannot tell you what we saw, unfortunately. Even I could begin to see the point. Incidentally, I feel that this is one place where I must contradict the record of Holmes's late biographer and protest that I never, ever witnessed Holmes 
gently waving his fingers about in time to the music, as Watson once wrote. The good doctor, on the other hand, was wont earnestly to perform this activity of the musically obtuse, particularly when he was tipsy. We drank champagne at the intermission and took to a quiet corner lest he be recognised. Holmes could be charming when he so desired, but that evening he positively scintillated during the intermission with stories about the primary cast members and over supper later talking about his conversations with the llamas in Tibet, his most recent monographs on varieties of lipstick and the peculiarities of modern tyre marks, the changes occasioned by the disappearance of castrati from the music world, and the analysis of some changes in rhythm in one of the arias we had just heard. I was quite dazzled by this rarely seen Holmes, a distinguished-looking, sophisticated bon vivant without a care in the world, who could also spend hours in a grey, biting mood, write precise monographs on the science of detection and paint blobs on the backs of bees to track them across the Sussex Downs. Holmes, I asked as we stepped into the street, I realise the question sounds sophomoric, but do you find that there are aspects of yourself with which you feel most comfortable? I only ask out of curiosity. You needn't feel obliged to answer. He offered me his arm, and formally I took it. Who am I, you mean? He smiled at the question, and gave what was, at first glance, a most oblique answer. Do you know what a fugue is? Are you changing the subject? No. I thought in silence for some distance before his answer arranged itself sensibly in my mind. I see. Two discreet sections of a fugue may not appear related unless the listener has received the entire work, at which time the music's internal logic makes clear the relationship. A conversation with you is most invigorating, Russell. That might have taken twenty frustrating minutes with Watson. Hello. What is this? He pulled me to a halt in the shadow of the building we had just rounded, and we gazed across to the area where the cab and Billy had been left, seeing with sinking hearts the flicker of naphtha flares and the distinctive milling outline of many constabulary helmets and capes. Loud voices called to one another, and as we watched, an ambulance pulled swiftly away. Holmes slumped against the building, stunned. Billy, he whispered hoarsely. How could they track us, Russell? Am I losing my grip? I have never come across a mind that could do this. Even Moriarty. He shook his head as if to clear it. I must see the evidence before those oafs obliterate it. Wait, Holmes. This could be a trap. There may be someone waiting with an air gun or a rifle. Holmes studied the scene before us through narrowed eyes and shook his head again slowly. We were excellent targets a number of times this evening. With all these police here, it would be a great risk for him. No, we will go. I only hope that someone with a bit of sense is in charge here. I followed his vigorous stride as best as I could in my heeled shoes, and as I came up behind him, I saw a small, wiry man of about thirty-five thrust out his hand and greet Holmes. Mr. Holmes, good to see you up and about. I wondered if you might not make an appearance. I figured you must be behind this somewhere. What precisely is this, Inspector? Well, as you can see, Mr. Holmes, the cab. May I help you, miss? This last was to me. Ah, oh, Russell, I should like to introduce you to an old friend of mine. This is Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard. His father was a colleague of mine on a number of cases. Lestrade, this is my... A quick smile touched his lips. My associate, Miss Mary Russell. Lestrade stared at the two of us for a moment, then, to my dismay, burst into raucous laughter. Was this to be the reaction of every policeman we met? Oh, Mr. Holmes, always the comedian you were. I forgot your little jokes for a minute. 
Holmes drew himself up to his full height and glared at the man in icy hauteur. Have you ever known me to jest about my profession, Lestrade? Ever? The last word cracked through the cold air like a shot, and Lestrade's humour was cut off in an instant. The remnant of the smile made his face sour and slightly rat-like, and he glanced at me quickly and cleared his throat. Ah, oh, yes, well, Mr. Holmes, I presume you'd like to see what they left of your cab. One of the men recognised Billy from the old days and thought to give me a ring on it. He'll get a promotion out of tonight's work, I don't doubt. And don't worry about your man. He'll be all right in a day or two, I imagine. Looked like a clout on the head, followed by a bit of chloroform. He was already coming around when they took him off. Thank you for that, Inspector. Have you already gone over the cab? His voice held little hope. No, no, we haven't touched it. Looked inside, that's all. I told you the man would get a promotion. Quick thinking he is. I noticed one of the uniformed men nearby fiddling needlessly with the horse's reins, his head tilted slightly in our direction. I nudged Holmes and addressed Lestrade. Inspector, that, I believe, is the individual over there. The man started and moved away guiltily, busying himself elsewhere. Lestrade and Holmes followed my eyes. Why, yes. How did you guess? Holmes interrupted. I believe you will find, Lestrade, that Miss Russell never guesses. She may occasionally reach tentative hypotheses without absolute proof, but she does not guess. I am glad, I added, that the gentleman is working his way back up to his former position of responsibility. Men with his background can be a valuable model for younger members of the force. I had Lestrade's full attention now. Do you know him then, miss? As far as I know, I've never seen him before tonight. Holmes allowed his eyes to wander off to the cab, his face inscrutable. Then how? Oh, but it is too obvious. An older man in a low position can either have got there by being, shall we say, of limited mental resource, which according to you he is not, or by backsliding. It could not have been a criminal act that pushed him down the ladder, or he would not still be in uniform. Which personality flaw it is can readily be ascertained by the broken veins in his face, while the deep furrows around his mouth indicate either pain or sorrow in recent years. I should suspect, as his body seems unimpaired, that the latter is to blame, which would explain the abuse of alcohol, and that in turn accounts for the demotion in rank. However, his general competency... And the fact that you mentioned the possibility of promotion tell me that he has passed through the crisis and will now serve as an example to the men around him. I gave the flabbergasted Lestrade my most innocent of smiles. It's really quite elementary, Inspector. The little man gaped and burst out laughing again. Yes, sir, Mr. Holmes, I do see what you mean. I don't know how you've done it, but it could have been you saying that. You're absolutely right, miss. His wife and daughter were killed four years ago, and he took to drinking, even at work. We kept him on a desk job where he'd do no one any harm, and a year ago he pulled himself together. He'll be back up there in no time, I think. Come now. I'll get a lamp so we can look at your cab. He went off shouting for a light. Russell, that last line was a bit overly dramatic, don't you think? Holmes murmured at my side. A good apprentice learns all from her master, sir, I answered demurely. Then let us go and see what is to be learnt from this old horse cab. I greatly desire news of this person who plagues us and continually attacks my friends. I hope that the case will at last provide us with a thread to grasp. The cab stood cordoned off in a circle of flares, its shabby exterior even more obvious now than it had been by the street lamps. This is where we found your man, Lestrade said, pointing. We tried to keep off the ground right there, but we had to get him up and out of there. He was lying on his side, curled up on that old suit with a rug tucked around him. 
What? The suit was Holmes's cabby outfit. The rug was from the cab. Yes. Wrapped up and snoozing like a baby he was. Holmes handed his hat, coat and stick to Lestrade and took a small, powerful magnifying lens out of his pocket. Down on the ground, he looked for all the world like some great lanky hound casting about for a scent. Finally, he gave a low exclamation and produced a small envelope from another pocket. Scraping gently at various tiny smudges on the paving stones, he sat back on his haunches with an air of triumph, careless of the beating his back had taken. What do you make of this, Russell? he asked, sketching a vague circle. I walked over to peer at the marks. Two pairs of feet? One has been in the mud today. The other? Is that oil? Yes, Russell. But there will be a third somewhere. At the door to the cab? No? Well, perhaps inside. And so saying, he opened the door. Lestrade, your men will go over the whole cab for fingerprints, I take it? Yes, sir. I've sent for an expert. He should be here before too long. New man, but seems good. MacReady, his name is. Ah, oh, yes, Ronald MacReady. Interesting article of his comparing worlds with the personality traits of habitual criminals, didn't you think? I, uh, didn't happen to see it, Mr. Holmes. Pity. Still, never too late. Russell, I take it these were all your things? I looked in past his shoulder at the wreckage. All that was left of my lovely and exorbitantly expensive clothes were the dress and cloak I was wearing and numerous scraps of coloured fabric. Small shreds of blue wool, green silk and white linen littered the inside of the cab, alternating with torn bits of the boxes, twine and paper they had been in. I picked up a short bit of string for something to fiddle with. The tufted leather seat had been deeply and methodically slashed from one end to another, with the exception of approximately a foot on one end of the front seat cushion. Horsehair stuffing had sifted over everything. Holmes got to work with his glass by the light Lestrade held for him. Envelopes were filled, notes made, questions asked. The fingerprint man arrived and set to. A brazier had appeared from somewhere, and the uniformed police were standing around it, warming their hands. The night was very late, and the cold, though not bitter, was penetrating. Impatient grumbles and glances were beginning to drift our way. There was no room for me in the cab, so I left, and went to stand by the fire with the police constables. I smiled up at the big one next to me. I wanted to tell you how glad I am of your presence here, all of you. Someone seems to bear Mr. Holmes' considerable ill will, and he is... Well, his body is not quite so fast as it once was. I feel considerably better with some of the forces best on hand. Particularly you, Mr... I leaned toward the older constable, a question on my face. Fowler, miss. Tom Fowler. Mr. Fowler, particularly with you. Mr. Holmes found your fast action most impressive. I smiled sweetly around the fire. Thank you, all of you, for your vigilance and attention to duty. I went back to the cab then, and though there were numerous glances, they were directed into the dark night, and there were no more grumbles. When Lestrade was called away to attend to some matter, I held the lamp for Holmes. So you think I am slowing down, do you? He said, amused. Your mind, I think not. I said that to encourage the troops, who were getting careless with having to stand about to no purpose. I exaggerated, perhaps, but they will be attentive now. I told you, I do not think we shall be attacked. And I am beginning to suspect that this opponent of yours knows you well enough to take your thoughts into account when planning his actions. Slow as I am, Russell. That idea had come to me. Now, he sat back. Your turn. I need you to go through and tell me if there are any scraps that are not from your things. It will take some time. So I will send over that tall young PC to help you 
and another to find some hot drink. I shall go and examine the neighbourhood. Take someone with you, Holmes, please. After your performance out there, they'll be tripping over each other in their eagerness to protect my doddering old frame. It took some time to sift through the cab's contents, but eventually, with the help of young P.C. Mitchell, I had a large pile of paper and fabric scraps heaped outside and three thin envelopes in my hand. We climbed out of the cab and stood stretching the cricks out of our spines, drinking mugs of hot sweet tea, until Holmes reappeared with his eager bodyguards. Thank you, gentlemen. You have been most dutiful. Go and have some tea now. Off you go. There's a good fellow, he said, giving the most persistent constable a pat between the shoulder blades that shoved him off towards the tea station. Russell, what have you found? One button, with a scrap of brown tweed attached, cut recently from its garment by a sharp instrument, another thick smudge of light brown clay, and one blonde hair, not my own, considerably shorter, plus a great deal of dust and rubbed about dirt and debris, indicating that the cab has not been cleaned in some time. It has also not been used in some time, Russell, so your three finds are undoubtedly worthy of our attention. And you, Holmes, what have you found? Several things of interest, but I need to smoke a pipe over them, perhaps two, before I have anything to say. Will we be here long, Holmes? Another hour, perhaps. Why? I have been drinking champagne, then coffee, now tea. I cannot last another hour without doing something about it. I was determined not to be embarrassed about the problem. Oh, of course. He looked around at the noticeable dearth of female company. Have the older man, Fowler, show you the facilities in the park. Take a lamp with you. With dignity, I summoned the man and explained the mission, and he led me off through the park along its soft gravel paths. We talked inconsequentially of children and green areas, and he stood outside as I entered the little building. I finished and went to wash my hands, placing the lamp on the shelf that stood above the basin. I reached for the tap and saw there a smear of light brown clay. I took the lamp to look more closely, unwilling to believe. Mr. Fowler, I called sharply. Miss? Go and get Mr. Holmes. Miss, is something wrong? No, something is not wrong for a change. Just get him. But I shouldn't. I'll be safe. Just go. After a moment's hesitation, his heavy footsteps went off quickly into the night. I heard his voice calling out loudly, answering shouts, and the thud of several running men returning up the path. Holmes stood at the door of the ladies, looking in uncertainly. Russell? Holmes, could the man we're looking for be a woman? Chapter 12 Flight. She eludes us on every side. She repudiates most of our rules and breaks our standards to pieces. Russell, you have struck the very question upon which I propose to meditate with my pipe. You have also saved me from the worst sin a detective can commit, overlooking the obvious. Show me what you have found. His eyes gleamed fiercely in the lamplight. More lamps were sent for, and soon the little stone building blazed with light. Fowler was consulted and confirmed that the building had been cleaned about eight o'clock on what was now the previous night. I stood back with Lestrade, watching Holmes as he worked, tensely examining every scrap of evidence, muttering to himself continually and occasionally snapping out instructions. Boots again. The small boots. Square heels, not new. A bicycle rider, I see. Lestrade, have you had the men's blocked off and the street outside? Good. She went here. Here she stood. Ha! 
another blonde hair. Yes, too long for a man in this day, I think, and quite straight. Mark these envelopes, please, Russell. Mud on her hands, traces in the sink, yes, and the tap. But no fingerprints on the mud. Gloves? Holmes looked up absently at his reflection in the mirror, whistling softly through his teeth. Why should she have mud on her gloves and wash them? A perplexing question. Another light over here, Lestrade, and have the photographer take another set of the cab, would you? After MacReady has finished. Yes, as I thought, right-handed, washed, shook the water from her hands, or rather her gloves, and to the door. Off the footprints, man, heaven help us. To the street, then. No, not to the street, back on the path, here it is, and here. He straightened up, winced frowned vacantly up at the bare branches overhead while we watched in silence. But that makes no sense unless... Lestrade, I shall need your laboratory tonight, and I want this entire park cordoned off. Nobody, nobody at all, to set foot here until I've seen it by daylight. Will it rain tonight, Russell? I don't know, London, but it does not feel like rain. It's certainly too warm to snow. No, I think we may risk it. Bring those envelopes, Russell. We have much to do before morning. Truth to tell, it was Holmes who had much to do, as there was but one microscope, and he refused to say what he was looking for. I labelled a few slides, my eyes heavy despite strong coffee, and the next thing I knew it was morning. Holmes was standing at the window tapping his pipe on his teeth, and I was nearly crippled from being asleep with my head on the desk for several hours. My spine cracked loudly as I sat back in the chair, and Holmes turned. Ah, oh, Russell, he said lightly, do you always make such a habit of sleeping in chairs? I doubt your aunt would approve. Mrs. Hudson definitely would not. I rubbed my eyes and glared at his ever-tidy person bitterly. I take it that your revolting good humour means that something from last night's exercise has pleased you. On the contrary, my dear Russell, it has displeased me considerably. Vague suspicions flit about my mind, and not one of them pleases me. His manner had grown distant and hard as he gazed unseeingly at the slides sprawled out on the workbench. He looked back at me with his steely eyes, then relaxed into a smile. I shall tell you about it on our way to the park. Oh, Holmes, be reasonable. You may be presentable, if a bit idiosyncratic in topper and tails, but how can I go out like this? He took in my rumpled gown, my town stockings and impractical shoes and nodded. I'll ask if there's a matron who can help us. Before he can move, there was a knock at the door. Come in. A tense young PC with an untamed cowlick stood in the doorway. Mr. Holmes... Inspector Lestrade asked me to tell you that there's a parcel for the young lady at the front desk, but... Holmes exploded out of the room, giving lie to any rumours of slowness, pain or rheumatism. I could hear his voice shouting. Don't touch that parcel. Don't touch it. Get a bomb disposal man first. Don't touch it. Did you catch the person who brought it, Lestrade? His voice faded as I followed him down the hall to the stairs, the young policeman jabbering away at my side. I was going to say, but he left. The package is with the bomb squad now, and Inspector Lestrade would like Mr. Holmes present at the questioning of the young man who brought it in. He didn't give me a chance to finish, sir. This last to Lestrade, who had intercepted Holmes in his precipitous flight. We could see the men at work downstairs, one with a stethoscope to the paper-wrapped parcel on the desk. We watched tensely and I became aware of the unaccustomed silence. Traffic had been diverted. Holmes turned to the inspector. You have the man who brought it? Yes, he's here. He says a man stopped him in the street an hour ago, offering two guineas to deliver this package. Small, blonde man in a heavy coat. Said it was for a friend who needed it this morning, but he couldn't take it himself. Gave him a guinea, then. 
and took his address to send the second after he'd confirmed delivery. Which will never arrive. The boy expects it to. Not too bright, this one. Not even sure he knows what a guinea's worth, just likes the shine. We had watched the two men work this whole time, their strain palpable as they gently snipped twine, cut away paper and uncovered the contents, which had the appearance of folded clothing. Gently, slowly, the package was disassembled. In the end, there lay draped over the police desk one silk shirt, a soft wool jacket, matching trousers, two angora stockings, and a pair of shoes. A folded note fell out of this last set of items and fluttered to the floor. Use your gloves on that, called Holmes. The puzzled but relieved bomb man brought the note to Lestrade in a pair of surgical tweezers. He read it, handed it to Holmes, and Holmes read it aloud in a voice that slowed and climbed in dismay and disbelief. Dear Miss Russell, he read, Knowing his limitations, I expect your companion will neglect to provide you with suitable clothing this morning. Please accept these with my compliments. You will find them quite comfortable. An admirer. Holmes blinked several times and hurled the note at Lestrade. Give this to your print man, he snarled. Give the clothes to the laboratory. Check them for foreign objects, corrosive powder, everything. Find out where they came from. And for the love of God, can someone please provide Miss Russell with suitable clothing so this case will not come to a complete standstill? As he turned away in a cold fury, I heard him breathe. This becomes intolerable. A variety of clothing appeared, part uniform, part civilian, all uncomfortable. We set off for the park in a police automobile. Lestrade in front with the driver, Holmes beside me, silent and remote, and staring out the window while his long fingers beat a rhythm on his knee. He did not divulge his laboratory findings. At the park, he dashed up and down the paths for a very few minutes, nodding to himself, then bundled us brusquely back into the car. He turned a deaf ear to Lestrade's questions, and we rode in silence back to New Scotland Yard to make our way to Lestrade's office, where we were left alone. Holmes went over to Lestrade's desk, opened a drawer, took out a packet of cigarettes, removed one, lit it with a vesta, and went to the window, where he stood with his back to me, staring unseeing out onto the busy embankment and the river traffic beyond, smoke curling around him in the thin winter's sunlight that seeped through the dirty glass. He smoked the cigarette to the end without speaking, then walked back to the desk and pressed the stub with great deliberation into the ashtray. I must go out, he said curtly. I refuse to take any of these heavy-footed friends of yours with me. They will send the wildlife scurrying for cover. While I am away, draw up a list of necessities and give it to the matron. Clothing for two or three days, nothing formal. Men's or women's, as you like. You'd best add a few things for me as well. You know my sizes. It will save me some time. I shall be back in a couple of hours. I stood up angrily. Holmes, you can't do this to me. You've told me nothing. You consulted me not at all, just pushed me here and there and run roughshod over any plans I might have had and kept me in the dark as if I were Watson. And now you propose to go off and leave me with a shopping list. He was already moving toward the door, and I followed him across the room, arguing. First you call me your associate, and then you start treating me like a maid. Even an apprentice deserves better than that. I'd like to know... I had just come up to the window when a sound like a meaty palm slapping a table came from just outside the wall, followed a split second later by a more familiar report. Holmes reacted instantly and dove across the room at me just as the window imploded in a shower of flying razor-sharp glass and a second slap came from the opposite wall. We both came up in a crouch and Holmes seized my shoulder. Are you hit? 
My God, was that... Russell, are you all right? He demanded furiously. Yes, I think so. Do you... But he was sprinting low towards the door as it opened, and an inspector in mufti looked in open-mouthed. Holmes gathered him up, and they pounded off down the stairs in pursuit. I steeled myself to creep around to the broken window and edge one eye over the lower corner. A steam launch was making its rapid way down river, but there was also a mother with a pram stopped on the bridge, turned to look at a retreating taxicab her shoulders in an attitude of surprise. Inside of a minute, Holmes and the others had swept up to her, and she was soon surrounded by gesticulating men pointing east over the river and south across the bridge. I saw Holmes look unerringly up to where I stood in the window, turn to say something to the Tweedy inspector, and then set his shoulders resolutely and walk, hatless and head down, back to the yard. With typical police efficiency and priorities, Lestrade's office was filled with people measuring angles and retrieving bullets from the brickwork, none of whom had a dustpan or a means of blocking the icy air from the window. I retreated into the next office but one, a room with no window. As soon as Holmes appeared, I knew there would be no arguing with him, although I intended to try. I think you'd best change that order to clothing for several days, Russell, were his first words. Stay away from windows. Don't eat or drink anything you're not absolutely certain is safe. And keep your revolver with you. Don't take sweets from strangers, you mean? I said sarcastically, but he would not anger. Precisely. I shall return in two or three hours. Be ready to leave when I get back. Holmes, you must at least... Russell, he interrupted, and came over to grasp my shoulders. I am very sorry, but time is of the utmost urgency. You were going to say that I must tell you what is happening, and I shall. You wish to be consulted. I intend to do so. In fact, I intend to place a fair percentage of the decisions to be made into your increasingly competent hands. But not just at this moment, Russell. Please be satisfied with that. And he shifted his hands to both sides of my head, bent forward, and brushed his lips gently across my brow. I sat down abruptly, felled by this thunderbolt, until long after he had gone. Which, I realised belatedly, was precisely why he had done it. Holmes's air of illicit excitement told me that he was extremely unlikely to be back from his haunts in two or three hours. Irritated, I scribbled the list for the young policewoman, gave her the last of my money, and turned my back on the windowless office. I was jumpy at every window I passed, but I wanted to take a closer look at the parcel of clothing that had arrived for me that morning, which I had only seen from a distance. I made my way to the laboratories, where I disturbed a gentleman in an unnecessarily professional white coat standing at a bench with a shoe in one hand. He turned at my entrance, and when I saw what he held, I was stunned speechless. The shoe was my own. This pair of shoes, now inhabiting the laboratory bench, had disappeared from my room some time during the autumn, in one of those puzzling incidents that happen and are finally dismissed with a shrug. I had worn them the second week of October, and two weeks later, when I went to look for them, they were not there. It troubled me, but frankly more because I took it as a sign of severe absent-mindedness than anything sinister. I had obviously left them somewhere. And here they were. I was relieved to see that the clothes were not familiar to me, though very much to my taste. They were all new, ready-made from a large shop in Liverpool, unremarkable, though not inexpensive. Thus far the examiners had found nothing but clothing, not so much as a stray shirt pin. The note that had accompanied the parcel lay in a steel tray across the bench, and I walked around to take a look at it. It was grey with fingerprint powder, 
But even if the sender had been careless, the paper was too rough to retain prints. I picked it up, read it with grudging amusement, noted casually the characteristics of the type, and started to lay it back down. And then I froze in disbelief. Yes, that's one too many shocks in the last few days, my brain commented analytically. I fumbled for a stool, and after some time became aware of the technician's alarm. I told him what I had seen. I told Lestrade the same thing when he appeared. Some time later I found myself in the windowless room with a policewoman who had returned from shopping, saying how she'd been careful to watch each item taken down and wrapped, and I made polite noises of, I suppose, gratitude, and then sat there for a long while with my brain steaming furiously away. By the time Holmes blew in, hair awry and a wild light in his eyes, I had recovered enough to be examining the woman's purchases. I drew back sharply as he entered and dropped a boot. Good God, Holmes, where have you been to pick up such a stench? Down on the docks, obviously, and from your feet I should venture to say you'd been in the sewers. But what is that horrid sweet smell? Opium, my dear protected child. It clawed its way into my hair and clothes, though I was not partaking. I had to be certain I was not being followed. Holmes, we must talk but I cannot breathe in your presence. There is a fine, if austere, set of shower baths in the prisoner's section. Take these clothes, but don't let them touch the things you have on. No time, Russell. We must fly. Absolutely not. My news was vital, but it would wait, and this would not. What did you say? He said dangerously. Sherlock Holmes was not accustomed to outright refusals, not even from me. I know you well enough, Holmes, to suspect that we are about to embark on a long and arduous journey. If it is a choice between expiring slowly from your fumes or being blown to pieces, I choose the latter. Gladly. Holmes glowered at me for some seconds, saw that I was on this issue inflexible, and with a curse worthy of the docks, snatched the proffered clothes and hurled himself out the door furiously demanding directions from the poor constable stationed outside. When he burst in again, I was ready for travel. A booted young man. No doubt I thought the newness of the clothes would quickly fade in Holmes's company. Very well, Russell, I am clean. Come. There's a cup of tea and a sandwich for you while I look to your back. For God's sake, woman, we must be on the docks in thirty-five minutes... We've no time for a tea party. I sat calmly, my hands in my lap. I noticed with interest that his cheekbones became slightly purple when he was severely perturbed, and his eyes bulged slightly. He was positively quivering when he threw off his coat, and one button of his misused shirt skittered across the floor. I put it into a pocket and picked up the gauze while he gulped his tea. I worked quickly on the nearly healed wound, and we were on the street within five minutes. We dove into the back of a sleek automobile that idled at the curb and squealed away. The driver looked more like a ruffian than he did the owner of such a machine, but I had no say in the matter. I waited for Holmes to stop his silent fuming, which was not until we were south of Tower Bridge. "'Look here, Russell,' he began. "'I won't have you—' but I cut him off immediately by the simple expedient of thrusting a finger into his face. Looking back, I am deeply embarrassed at the effrontery of a girl not yet nineteen, pointing her finger at a man nearly three times her age and her teacher to boot, but at the time it seemed appropriate. You look here, Holmes. I cannot force you to confide in me, but I will not be bullied. You are not my nanny. I am not your charge to be protected and coddled. You have not given me any cause to believe that you are dissatisfied with my ability at deduction and reasoning. You admit that I am an adult. You called me woman not ten minutes ago. And as a thinking adult partner, I have the right to make my own decisions. 
I saw you come in filthy and tired, having not eaten, I was sure, since last evening, and I exercised my right to protect the partnership by putting a halt to your stupidity. Yes, stupidity. You believe yourself to be without the limitations of mere mortals, I know, but the mind, even your mind, my dear Holmes, is subject to the body's weakness. No food or drink and filth on an open wound puts the partnership, puts me, at an unnecessary risk, and that is something I won't have. I had forgotten the driver, who proved an appreciative audience to this dramatic declaration. He burst into laughter and pounded on the wheel as he slid through the narrow streets, dodging horses, walls and vehicles. Right good job, miss, he guffawed. Make him wash his socks at night too, won't you? At last here I had the grace to blush. The driver was still grinning, and even Holmes had softened when we reached our destination, a dank and filthy wharf somewhere down near Greenwich. The river was greasy and black in the early twilight, high and very cold-looking. Its calmer reaches one undulating mat of flotsam. The swollen body of a dog rocked gently against a pier. The area was deserted, though voices and machinery noises drifted over from the next row of buildings. "'Thank you, young man,' said Holmes quietly, and, "'Come, Russell.' We walked carefully down the planks to a gate of peeling corrugated iron, which slid open with an eerie silence and closed again after us. The man on the gate followed us down to the end of the wharf, where lay a nondescript small ship, a boat, really. A man standing on the deck hailed us in a low voice and came down the gangway to take our valises. Good day, Mr. Holmes. Welcome aboard, sir. I am very glad to be aboard, Captain. Very glad indeed. This is my... He cocked an eyebrow at me. My partner, Miss Russell. Russell, Captain Jones here, runs one of the fastest boats on the river and has agreed to take us out to sea for a while. To sea? Oh, Holmes, I don't think. Russell, we will talk shortly. Jones, shall we be away? Aye, sir. The sooner the better. If you'd like to go below... My boy Brian will be with you in a minute to show you your quarters. The child appeared as we made our way down the narrow passage, opened a door, ducked his head shyly, and went to help his father cast off. A narrow set of stairs led down to a surprisingly spacious cabin, a lounge of sorts with a tiny kitchen galley at one side, and soft chairs and a sofa bolted to the floor. A corridor opened off the forward side, and doors led to two small bedrooms with a lavatory and bath between them. Those are not the proper technical terms, I am aware, but the whole area so obviously was intended for the comfort of non-sailors. The lay terms are perhaps more accurate. We settled ourselves on two chairs as the engine noise deepened, and watched London slip by outside the windows. I leant forward. Now, Holmes, there is something I must tell you. First, some brandy. Your plying me with that stuff becomes tedious, I said crossly. Prevents seasickness, Russell. I don't get seasick. Miss Russell, I believe you are becoming quite dissolute with the shady associations of the last few days. That, if my ears do not deceive me, was an untruth. You were about to tell me on deck that you did not wish to go to sea because it made you feel ill, were you not? Oh, very well. I admit I don't like going to sea. Give me the brandy. I took two large and explosive mouthfuls to Holmes' disapproving grimace and banged the glass on the table. Now, Holmes. Yes, Russell. You wish to hear the results of today's opium dens and... Holmes! I nearly shouted. Would you listen to me? Of course, Russell. I am happy to listen to you. I merely thought. The shoes, Holmes. Those shoes that arrived in the parcel? They were mine. My own shoes. Taken from my rooms at Oxford. 
They disappeared sometime between the 12th and the 30th of October. A half minute of silence fell between us. Good Lord, he said at last. How extraordinary. I am most grateful to you, Russell. I should have missed that entirely. He was so obviously disturbed that any faint malicious glee I might have had at my second piece of news withered away. There is more. I think, in fact, that you might like to finish that drink first, Holmes, because that note that was in the shoes... I examined it very, very closely, Holmes, and I believe it was typed on the same machine as the notes concerning Jessica Simpson's ransom. There was no softening the blow. The bare facts were awful enough, but the implications inherent in my having to tell him were for him truly terrible. Twice now, in little more than two days, I had rescued him from a major error. The first might have been excused, though it nearly cost Watson his life. This one had been in his hands, under his nose, at the very time he had been searching for just such a clue. It changed the investigation, and he had missed it. He stood up abruptly and turned his back to me at the window. Holmes, I... One warning finger was raised, and I bit back the words that would only have made matters worse. Holmes, four days ago you were concussed and bleeding. Holmes, you've had less than a dozen hours sleep in the last eighty. Holmes, you were exhausted and furious when you saw the note, and you would have called to mind the characteristic missing serif on the A, and the off-centre tipsy L, and the high M. You'd have consciously remembered seeing them, if not today, then tomorrow or the next day, Holmes. However, I said nothing, because he would only hear, Holmes, you're slipping. We were well clear of London's fringes by the time I saw the back of his neck relax into an attitude of straightforward contemplation of data. I heaved a silent sigh of relief and settled myself to a study of the opposite windows. Ten minutes later he came back and sat down with his pipe. He paused with the match alight in his hand. You are quite certain, I take it? Yes. I began to recite the characteristics I had noted, but he cut me off. That is not necessary, Russell. I have great faith in your eyes. He puffed up a small cloud and shook out the match. And your brain he added. Well done. It does mean we now have something resembling a motive. Revenge for thwarting Jessica's kidnapping? That, and the knowledge that we are waiting to pounce on any similar attempt in the future? Anyone familiar with Watson's literary fabrications will be certain that Sherlock Holmes always gets his man. Or in this case, woman. I was pleased to hear the customary ironic humour and no more in his voice. It is, however, intriguing that I could find no indication of an up-and-coming gang of criminals with a female head. I gratefully shelved the uncomfortable topic and asked for the results of the last eighteen hours. He looked mildly surprised. Eighteen hours? Surely I kept you abreast of my thoughts last night? Your mutterings in the park were completely unintelligible, and if you spoke to me in the laboratory before dawn, I did not hear it. Odd. I thought I was quite garrulous. Well then, to the park, or rather to the remnants of a once noble four-wheeler, which at first glance appears to be the least interesting of the night's works. There were two large men there, and one, so I thought, smaller, lighter man wearing boots with distinctive square heels. The two large men came up behind Billy as he was standing next to the horse, apparently talking to someone, though I should have thought him too wary. At any rate, they disposed of Billy with a cosh and chloroform was applied by small boots. The destruction of your clothing was carried out by the two big men, 
while the smaller stayed with Billy and kept the chloroform dripping onto his face. When they had finished, small boots climbed in and applied the knife methodically to the seat, at which time the fibres of the other fabric pieces became embedded in the cuts, despite the extreme sharpness of the blade. It was, incidentally, a short-handled, double-edged knife, the blade being about six inches in length and relatively narrow. Nasty weapon. A flick knife? Probably. The circumstances of the cab destruction troubled me. Did you see anything amiss? The slashes seemed odd. They're so precise. All the same height and direction, but they stop before the end of the seat. It was almost as if they were searching for something under the leather. There was no sign that a hand had pushed into the cuts, was there? There was not. And of equal interest is the question, why was it given over to Small Boots, the boss, to do those final cuts? I am missing something there, Russell. I desire to study the photographs. Perhaps that will refresh my memory. And when will that be? A look of grim humour flickered across his face. That, Russell, is up to you. No, let me explain that in its logical place at the end. I dislike having to leap about in the narration of evidence, as you well know. To continue. Left in the cab were one button, complete with a well-defined thumbprint of a large man, one blonde hair, and a number of smudges of light brown mud on the floor and the seats. We shall return to that last item in a moment. As you were sifting through the wreckage of your wardrobe, I was tracking. The mud was quite clearly followed. It had come across the park on the soft gravel pathway, or so it seemed at first. Of the big boots there was no sign, which was singular. It was not until you found the same mud in the ladies that I discovered the truth, that the three had not come across the park, but rather had come around the side of the park on the hard, well-travelled, paved path. The two big boots had returned that way, but small boots, walking backwards, had crossed on the soft central path, entered the ladies backwards, washed and walked, still backwards, to the same point where they had entered the park. The three then boarded a vehicle of some kind and drove away. And you needed to see the prints by daylight to be certain that the set running down the middle was indeed backwards? Precisely. You have seen my monograph on footprints, 47 methods of concealing one's trail? No. In it I mention that I have used various means of reversing footprints and, as you saw Tuesday morning, hiding one inside another. But there seem to be flaws detectable to the careful eye. Another article I am working on is concerned with the innate differences between the male and female footprint. Have I shown that to you? No, of course, you've been away. I have found that no matter what kind of shoe is on the foot, the lie of the toes and the way the heel hits the ground differ between the sexes. I took the idea from a conversation we once had. At night I suspected. After your find and after I had seen the footprints by day, I knew. This is a woman, five and a half feet tall and slim, less than eight stone. She may be blonde. Just maybe? Just maybe, he repeated. She is intelligent, well-read, and has a particularly grotesque and creative sense of humour. The note, you mean? I was aware of it before that arrived. You know my monograph on London soils? Notes on some distinctive characteristics, I began. That one, yes. I have not demanded of you an expertise in the study of London, but as you know, I spent most of my life there before I retired. I breathed her air, I trod her ground, and I knew her like... as a husband knows his wife. 
I did not react to the simile, despite the Hebraic overtones to the verb no. Some of her soils I can identify by eye, others need a microscope. The soil I found in the cab and on the wash basin was a not uncommon variety. My own lodgings in Baker Street were built on top of such a soil, but it crops up in several places, each distinguishable one from the other only by very close examination under a strong lens. And the mud on small boots came from Baker Street? How did you know? he said with a smile. Lucky guess, I answered dryly. He raised an eyebrow. Low jokes do not suit you, Russell. Sorry, but what does the fact that she chose to walk through Baker Street before going to the park have to do with it? You tell me, he demanded in a thin echo from a spring day long, long ago. Obediently, I set to reviewing the entire episode, running my mind over the facts like a tongue over teeth, searching for a gap in the smooth, hard surfaces. The mud, which was on the path, in the cab, on the seats. On the seats, my mind whispered. Down the path. Is that not a great deal of mud? and in the ladies, grotesque and creative sense of humour, on the floor, in the wash basin. The basin? That means... It was on her hand, the mud, her left hand and the right boot. I stopped, disbelieving, and looked at Holmes. His grey eyes were positively dancing. She replenished the mud to keep the path obvious. This whole episode? It was deliberately staged. She wants you to know that she was there, and she put the Baker Street mud on her shoe to thumb her nose at you. She even washed her hands of it in the ladies to leave you that datum. If you hadn't already worked out that he was a she, I can't believe it. No one could be mad enough to mock you like that. What kind of game is she playing? A decidedly unpleasant sort of a game, with three bombs and a death thus far. But I agree. The style of humour is a match with the clothing parcel and the exploding beehive. One is forced to wonder. He mused, and his voice drifted away. Yes? I encouraged. Nothing, Russell. Merely speculation without data. A fruitless exercise at the best of times. I was reflecting that the only truly superior mind I have encountered among the criminal classes was Moriarty, which ill-equips me for the possibility of subtlety in our current foe. Were I quite certain of, for example, the intent of the marksman who shot at us in Lestrade's office, or of Dixon's efforts, or even... Yes, I suppose. He drifted off again. Holmes, do I understand you are right, that the actions against us were not actually intended to be deadly? Oh, deadly, certainly. Though perhaps not merely deadly. But yes, you understand me. I mistrust a series of failures when the author otherwise gives signs of great competence. Accidents are not unknown, but I dislike coincidences, and I deny out of hand the existence of a guardian angel. Yes, he said thoughtfully, and I winced as I heard his next phrase coming. It is quite a pretty problem. Quite a three-piper, eh, Holmes? I said in hearty jocularity. He could be the most irritating individual. No, no, not yet. Nicotinic meditation serves to clarify the known facts, not pull them out of thin air. I do not feel we have all the facts. Very well, but surely you can speculate in generalities. If she didn't wish to kill us, what are her intentions? I did not say that she does not intend to kill us, 
just possibly not yet. If, for the sake of hypothesis, we assume that what has occurred over the course of the last few days is more or less what she had in mind, then we are left with three possible inferences. One, that she does not want us all actually dead at this moment. Two, that she wishes us to be fully aware of an intelligent, dedicated, resourceful and implacable enemy breathing almost literally down our collars. And three, that she wants us either to go to ground or leave England. And isn't that what we're doing? Indeed, he said complacently. I... I stopped, shut my mouth, waited. Her actions tell me that it is what she wants me to do. She knows me well enough to assume that I will perceive her intent and refuse to cooperate. Therefore, I shall do what she wants. I decided finally that the brandy was to blame for the dullness of my logical faculties. For though I was certain that there was a basic fallacy in his reasoning, I could not put my finger on precisely the juncture. I shook my head and plunged on. Why not just disappear for a few days? Is it really necessary to... Take flight, he supplied. Beat a hasty retreat, run away. You're quite right. This morning I should have agreed that a few days' retreat to my cross flat or one of my bolt holes was sufficient for regrouping. I shuddered here at the thought of being confined with Holmes in the storage room for any length of time. But today's events have proven me wrong. Not the clothing parcel. That was a clever joke. Even the shoes, though sinister, could be got around. That bullet. It nearly hit you. I believe it was meant to, he said. And although he did not look at me, the control in his voice and the small twitch in the right side of his mouth spoke volumes of the rage and apprehension this threat set off on him. To cover his gaff, he rose in a jerk and began to stride up and down, his hands behind him as if tucked beneath the tails of a frock coat the smouldering pipe he still gripped endangering his clothing. Words tumbled out of him as he paced, spoken in his high voice as if berating himself. I begin to feel like a piece of driftwood tumbling about between waves and sand, snatched up and tossed from one place to another. It is a most disconcerting feeling. Were I alone, I might almost be tempted to let myself be tumbled just to see where I washed up. That, however, is not an option. What, then, are the options? Offensive? An all-out attack? On what? Beating at mist with a cricket bat? Defence? How does one defend against a mirror image? She has read Watson's tales and my bee-book, the monographs on soil and footprints not available to the general public, and God knows what else. A woman... She has turned my own words against me, caused me considerable mental and physical distress, kept me off my balance for five whole days, chased and harried me across my home territory until I am forced to go to ground, to see. Do you know? He broke off and whirled around to shake an outraged pipe stem at me. This person has even penetrated into one of my bolt holes. Yes, today there were signs. I still cannot believe that a woman can have done this, deducing my deductions, plotting my moves for me, and all the time giving the impression that to her it is a deadly but effortless and highly amusing game. Even Moriarty did not go so far, and he was a master without parallel. The mind capable of such coup de maître, maîtresse, he stopped and straightened his shoulders with a jerk, as if to settle his clothing back into place. A most gratifyingly challenging opponent, this, he said in a calmer voice, and lit his pipe which had gone out. When it was going again, he continued in a completely different vein. Russell, 
I have been considering your words of this morning. I do occasionally take the thoughts of others into account, you know, particularly yours. I have to admit that you are completely justified in your protest. You are an adult, and by your very nature I was quite wrong to treat you as if you were Watson. I apologise. I was, as one might imagine, completely flabbergasted and highly suspicious. But he went on as if discussing the weather. Today, while I was on my distressingly fruitless quest for information through the human sewers of fair London town, it occurred to me that the matter of your future has come to a head. This peculiar present situation has forced it. But it should have come sooner or later. The question I am faced with is, what does one do with a student who has passed every examination laid before her? Eventually she must be removed from in statu pupillaris and allowed to assume the rights and responsibilities of maturity. In your case, every paper I've set you, every test up to the viva voci question of the mud on our opponent's footwear has come up an alpha. I have then a limited number of options. Considering the gravity of this particular case, I feel I should be justified in removing you from the firing line as I did Watson until I can clear it up. No, do not interrupt. Much to my displeasure, I find I cannot bring myself to attempt that. For one thing, the logistics of keeping you under control are too daunting. It has been on my mind since Wales that an apprentice kept from her journeyman's papers will spoil. Faced with this, what for lack of a better term I shall call a case, I have two choices. I can maintain your apprenticeship, as you yourself called it, or I can grant you your mastery. Having never been one for half measures, I see no point in delaying the inevitable. Therefore, he stopped, took his pipe from his mouth, looked into the bowl, put it back into his mouth, reached for the pouch in his pocket, and I very nearly screamed at him with the tension of being torn between thank God, here it comes at last, and oh God, here it comes, he's sending me away. He opened the tobacco pouch and dug from it a small, much-folded scrap of onion skin, dropped it in front of me, went to the ashtray, clipped to the table, and began to scrape the dottle from his pipe while I unfolded the paper. On it, in five lines of minute, cramped, antique, and graphologically cryptic script were written Egypt, Alexandria, Said Abu Bahada, Greece, Thessaloniki, Tomas, Catalepo, Italy, Ravenna, Father Domenico, Palestine, Jaffa, Ali and Mahmoud, Haza, Morocco, Rabat, Peter Thomas. Each of the personal names was followed by a series of numbers that looked like a radio frequency. I looked up, but Holmes was at the window again, his unrevealing back to me. I have said before this time that I regard it as stupidity rather than courage to overlook a danger that presses as close as this one has. Even my critics will not accuse me of stupidity as I should not have reached my present age after a lifetime of the rough and tumble. I remember vividly, as if it were last week, rather than two and a half decades ago, sitting in Watson's chair and admitting to him that London was too hot for my safety. The current state of affairs is remarkably similar. The admission then caused me some shame, but that was half a lifetime ago. And since then I have learnt, slowly and painfully, that time and distance can prove a powerful weapon. It is not one that comes naturally to my hand, I admit. I much prefer direct attack, complete immersion and a quick finish. However, there is much to be said for the occasional judicious, prodigious expenditure of time. What sort of time are you thinking of here, Holmes? I asked warily. His most famous hiatus had lasted three years. That would certainly drive a cart and horses through my university degree. 
not terribly long. Enough to instill doubts in our opponent. Was she wrong after all? Did I just choose to vanish? Where on earth am I? And to allow Mycroft and the elephantine Scotland Yard to sweep up the data and begin to sift it over. By the time we return, we, I snatched at. The momentum will have been taken from her. She will be furious and careless with the knowledge that we have removed ourselves from her rules, that we have opted out of the traditional and expected programme of threat, challenge, response and counterattack. For better or for worse, you are in this case. My brief surge of triumph was quickly submerged in a backwash of conflicting questions and feelings. Was he fleeing because he was saddled with me? And what on earth did he have in mind? Tibet? What is more, you are in it as God help us, my partner, or as near to such a creature as I am ever likely to see. Given the circumstances, I have no choice. I have to trust you. I could think of no sensible response to this, so I blurted out the first thing that came to mind. What should you have done if I had walked through my lodging door the other night? Hmm, I wonder. Perhaps, unfortunately, that question does not pertain. Here we stand. I can no other. And as a means of noting the fact of your accession to the lofty rights and privileges of partnership, I shall grant you a boon. I shall allow you to make the next decision. Where shall we go to keep from harm's way for a bit? Do you know, Russell? He said in a voice that verged on playful. I don't believe I've had a holiday in twenty-five years. In the past seventy-two hours... I had seen a bomb on my door and the results of another on Holmes's back, spent thirteen hard, tense hours slogging towards London, waved a gun at Holmes, seen my first major attempt at high fashion reduced to shreds, been ill-fed, underslept, half-frozen and shot at, witnessed Holmes in more perturbation than ever before, and now this wild swing from matter-of-fact confidences to near-teasing merriment. It was all a bit much. I looked down at the paper in my hand, two inches of nearly transparent onion skin and its five lines of writing. Are these our only options? I asked. By no means. Captain Jones is quite willing to steam around in circles if we ask him, or to head for South America or the Northern Lights. There are few limits, although if you wish to try breaking the bank at Monte Carlo, I shall have to arrange a discreet transfer of funds. Just avoid the United Kingdom or New York for six or eight weeks. Two months? Holmes, I can't be away for two months. I'll be sent down if I miss that much time. And my aunt will have the army out. And Mrs. Hudson and Watson. Mrs. Hudson will embark tomorrow on a cruise. A cruise? Mrs. Hudson? To visit her family in Australia, I believe. And you need not concern yourself with Dr. Watson either. His greatest danger will be gout from high living, where Mycroft has him secreted. Your college and tutors will grant you an exit while you attend to your urgent family business. Your aunt will be told that you are away. Good Lord! If Mycroft can tame her, he's a valuable ally indeed. I could feel my objections beginning to waver. Well... Who are these people? I asked. Holmes plucked the paper from my hand. This is Mycroft's writing, he said by way of explanation. And Mycroft has tasks that need doing in these places? Precisely. His words were, if we choose to remove ourselves from the field of combat whilst the scouts assess the enemy's position, we may as well be of some use to his majesty and might care for a change of scenery under his auspices. Holmes's eyes were filled with mischief and amusement, and I could see that he had already laid our case to one side. He waved the paper gently in front of my nose. 
It has been my experience, he added, that Mycroft's assignments tend to offer quite extraordinary amounts of entertainment. I acquiesced, took the paper from his fingers, spread it out on the table in front of me, and pointed to the fourth line. Yisrael. What? Palestine. Israel. Zion, the Holy Land. I desire to walk through Jerusalem. Holmes nodded slowly, bemused. I think I can honestly say that particular destination should not have been my first choice. Greece, yes. Morocco, perhaps. Even Egypt. But Palestine? Very well, the choice is yours. And I am certain our foe will never guess that as my destination. To Palestine it is. By midnight, we were off the coast of France, and with no signs of anyone in our wake and strict radio silence maintained, the tight knot that had held me since Tuesday evening was beginning to loosen. Captain Jones came into our cabin, a barrel-shaped and lugubrious individual with thinning, once-red hair, distinguishable from the four crew members under his command by the state of his fingernails, which were slightly blacker than theirs, and the straight-spined, confident air of one who caters to royalty. The boy was a smaller version of his father, and all, including the child, had been chosen by Mycroft from wherever he was holed up with Watson. "'Good evening, Jones,' said Holmes. "'Brandy or whisky? "'No, thank you, sir. "'I don't drink when I'm out to sea. "'Asking for problems, it is, sir. "'I just came down to ask if you decided yet on our course.' Palestine, Jones. Palestine, sir? Palestine, you know. Israel, Zion, the Holy Land. It is on your charts, I assume? Of course, sir. It's just that, well, if you've not been there recently, you'll not find it the easiest place to move around in, so to speak. There has been a war on, you know? He offered in a mild understatement. I am aware of that, Jones. London will have to be notified, and they shall make all the necessary arrangements. Very good, sir. Shall I set course tonight, then? The morning is just as well, Jones. There is no hurry. Is there, Russell? I opened my eyes. None at all, I confirmed, and closed them again. In the morning it is, then, sir. Miss. His footsteps faded up the stairs. Holmes stood silently, and I felt his gaze on me. Russell? Hmm? There's nothing more that needs doing tonight. Go to bed. Or shall I cover you with a blanket again? No, no, I shall go. Good night, Holmes. Good night, Russell. I awoke when the engines changed their sounds in the early grey light of dawn. Passing through the cabin for a glass of water, I saw the silhouette of Holmes, curled in a chair, staring out at the sea, knees to chin, pipe in hand. I said nothing as I went back to bed, and I do not think he noticed me. I slept all that day, and when I awoke, it was a summer's evening. It was not actually summer, of course, and we were to have rain during the weeks that followed, but we had sun enough that Holmes and I could spend hours darkening our skins up on the deck. To think of London huddled under its blanket of sleet and thick yellow fogs as we sweated and dozed was like imagining another world, and I often found myself hoping fervently that our attempted murderer was caught in the worst of it with bronchitis and chillblains. The days passed quickly. To my surprise, Holmes did not seem to chafe under the enforced rest, but appeared relaxed and cheerful. We spent hours devising complex mind games, and he taught me the subtleties of codes and ciphers. We took apart and rebuilt the ship's spare radio, and began an experiment on the point at which various heated substances will self-ignite, but as it made the captain exceedingly nervous, we moved on to picking pockets. Christmas came and went, with flaming pudding and crackers with paper crowns and carols about iron-hard ground and snowy footprints. And after dinner, Holmes came onto the upper deck with a chess set. 
We had not played more than a handful of games since I had gone up to Oxford, and we quickly set to rediscovering the other's gambits and style. I had improved in the last eighteen months, and he no longer had to spot me a piece which pleased us both. We played regularly, though first a black bishop and then the white king rolled overboard, and we had to improvise substitutes, a salt cellar and a large greasy nut and bolt, respectively. Holmes won most of the games, but not all. He was a good player, ruthless and imaginative, but an erratic one, for he tended to glory in bizarre gambits and impossible saves, rather than the methodical building of defence and thoroughly supported offence. Chess for him was an exercise, boring at times, and always a poor substitute for the real game, rather like scales compared to the public performance of a concerto. One hot afternoon off the island of Crete, he came to the board with a greater focus than was his wont, and a nervous intensity that I found disturbing. We played three half games, scrapped each time when he was satisfied with the direction each opening gambit had established. The fourth game, though, began with a peculiarly gleeful attitude, and opening moves along the very edge of the queen's side of the board. I braced myself for a wild game. Holmes had drawn white, and he came out, whirling his knights across the board like a berserker with his chain mace, sixteen squares of shifting destruction and disruption that had me slapping together hasty defences at half a dozen spots across the board, summoning and abandoning bishops and rooks, spraying pawns ahead of the fray, and leaving them in odd niches as the action stumbled away across the board. One after another he swatted aside my defences, until in desperation I separated my royalty, moving my queen away from the vulnerable king to draw my opponent's fire. For a time I succeeded, but eventually he trapped her with a knight, and I lost her. "'What's the matter with you, Russell?' he complained. "'Your mind's not on the game.' "'It is, you know, Holmes,' I said mildly and reach forward to move a pawn, and with that move the entire haphazard disarray fell into a neat and deadly trap that depended on two pawns and a bishop. In three moves I had him mated. I wanted to whoop and leap into the air and kiss Captain Jones on his bristly cheek for the sheer joy of seeing Holmes's consternation and amazement, but instead I just sat and grinned at him like a dog. He stared at the board like a conjurer's audience, and the expression on his face was one of the biggest prizes I have ever won. Then it broke, and he slapped his knee with a short bark of delighted laughter and rearranged the pieces to replay the last six moves. At the end of it, he wagged his head in appreciation. Well done, Russell. Juicedly clever, that. More devious than I'd have given you credit for. My children have bested me he quoted somewhat irreverently. I wish I could claim credit for it, but the move came up in a game with my maths tutor a few months ago. I've been waiting for the opportunity to use it on you. I'd not have thought that I could be tricked into overlooking a pawn, he admitted. That's quite a gambit. Yes, I fell for it too. Sometimes you have to sacrifice a queen in order to save the game. He looked up at me, startled, and then back to the board, and his face changed. A tightness crept slowly into his features until he looked pinched and pale beneath the brown of his skin's surface, as someone does who is stricken by a gnawing pain in the vital organs. Holmes? Holmes, are you all right? Huh? Oh, yes, Russell. I am fine. Never better. Thank you, Russell, for such an interesting game. You have given me much food for thought. His hard visage relaxed into the gentlest of smiles. Thank you, my dear Russell. He reached out, but his fingers did not quite touch my cheek before he pulled them back, stood and turned to go below. I sat on the sun-drenched deck and watched his back disappear. 
the victory turned to ashes in my mouth and wondered what I had done. I did not see him again until we arrived at Jaffa. Excursus, a gathering of strengths. Chapter 13, Umbilicus Mundi. It will serve a useful purpose by restoring our courage and stimulating research in a new direction. I had not realized how greatly I desired Palestine until one of its towns leapt out at me from the list of places offered us, and the name was on my lips. I had no doubt that some day, next year, I should make my pilgrimage to the birthplace of my people. But a pilgrimage is a planned and contemplated event of the mind, and perhaps the heart, which this most emphatically was not. When I was beset by fear and confusion, when no ground was sure beneath my feet and familiar places threatened, this foreign land reached out to me, called me to her, and I went, and found comfort and shelter and counsel. I, who had neither family nor home, found both there. Palestine, Israel, that most troubled of lands, robbed, raped, ravaged, revered for most of four millennia, beaten and colonized by Sargon's Akkadians in the third millennium BCE and by Allenby's England in the common era's second millennium, holy to half the world, a narrow strip of marginally fertile soil whose every inch has felt the feet of conquering soldiers, a barren land whose only wealth lies in the children she had borne, Palestine. At dusk we were making way casually south, parallel to the far-off shore, but when night had fully fallen, the captain changed to due east, and, engines fast and quiet, we made for land. Holmes appeared with a nearly flat knapsack and a preoccupied air, and at one in the morning we were bundled onto a ship's boat with muffled rowlocks and taken ashore. Our landing site was just south of Jaffa, or Yafo, a town whose Jewish population had been forced to flee from Arab violence during the war. Imagine my pleasure, then, when we were summarily shoved into the burnoosed arms of a pair of Arab cutthroats and abandoned. Before the boat had disappeared into the night, we had sunk, unseen, into the war-ravaged land. They were not cutthroats, or perhaps I should say, they were not merely cutthroats. They were not even Arabs. We called them at their invitation Ali and Mahmoud, but in a cooler climate they would have been Albert and Matthew, and certain diphthongs in their English exuded public school and Oxbridge. Holmes said they were from Clapham. He also said that although they looked like the brothers they claimed to be and acted like twins, they were at best distant cousins. I did not inquire further, but contented myself with watching the pair of them, hand in hand in the fashion of Arab men, as they strolled the dusty roads, chattering interminably in colloquial Arabic, and gesticulating wildly with their free hands, while we followed in their wake. If our two guides were not what they appeared, neither was anything else in the weeks that followed. The drab boat that had brought us from England was experimental, an outgrowth of war's technology. Its crew were not simply sailors, despite the presence of the child. Even the two of us were not as we seemed, a father and son of dark-skinned, light-eyed nomads. Our very presence in the land had a heavy touch of the unreal about it. For the first two weeks, we wandered with no apparent aim, performing a variety of tasks that again seemed aimless. We retrieved a document from a locked house. We reunited two old friends. We made detailed maps of two yawningly unimportant sites. During this dreamy time, I had the feeling that we were being observed, if not judged, though I could never decide if someone was testing our abilities or waiting for a job to appear that we were suited for. In either case, perhaps even coincidentally, a case abruptly appeared to immerse us and shore up our sagging self-confidence with a sharp exhilaration of danger 
and the demands of an uncomfortable way of life. I soon discovered in myself a decided taste for that way of life, as the sense of daring that the tamer liberty of Wales had given me flowered into a pure, hot passion for freedom. If Mycroft's hidden purpose was to provide us with an exotic form of holiday, it certainly succeeded. Not that we were under his control, or even supervision. Mycroft's name opened a few doors for us and smoothed some passages, but travelling under his cachet did not mean that we were under his protection. Indeed, our pursuits in the Holy Land took us into some quite interesting situations. However, the dangers we faced, aside from the microbial and insectoidal, although immediate and personal, particularly for Holmes, who at one point fell into unfriendly hands, were also refreshingly direct and without subtlety. Both of us took injuries, but neither seriously. Indeed, other than being shot at by a strikingly incompetent marksman out in the desert, and later set upon by thugs just outside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, my own most uncomfortable moment was when I was cornered by a trio of amorous and intoxicated merchants in the Arab quarter. Even the revelation of the quantity of hair beneath my turban did not give them much pause, as they seemed equally willing to pursue a woman as the young man they had thought me. I nearly committed murder that day, not on the merchants, but on Holmes, for the highly amused reluctance with which he came to my assistance. As I said, I found this combination of unreality and hazard immensely appealing, and indeed it gave me a lasting taste for what is called intelligence, which is not to be confused with wisdom, being, in fact, often completely devoid of sense. At the time, all I thought about was that we were safe from our shadowy pursuer, and that Mycroft was proving a powerful, if enigmatic, ally. This is not the place to burden the reader with a detailed, that is, book-length, account of our expedition to Palestine, for although it had its own distinct points of interest, it had almost no bearing on the case that had sent us there. It was an excursus, the chief benefit of which was that it enabled us to reconsider the balance in our relationship and to come to a decision about how our case at home was to be handled while Mycroft and Lestrade were assembling data for us. That our time of exile changed my life personally, that it endowed me with a sense of the texture of history that has stayed with me to this day, that it moved me to profound wonder and joy and fury, that the sense of Palestine as a refuge made me a Jew more than any one thing apart from the accident of my birth. All these have proven to be of lasting interest to me personally, but of peripheral interest to this particular narrative. Nor shall I subject the reader to a travelogue of that most remarkable of lands. We stayed for a few days in a mud hut near Jaffa, getting our bearings and perfecting our disguises, which Holmes had used before, in Mecca, before setting off south. We moved into the empty desolation of nomadic peoples and ruined monasteries, where the desert shimmered even in January. We walked and rode across the wilderness to the Salton Sea, and in the dark before the moon rose, we floated in its remarkable buoyant waters, and I felt the light of the stars on my naked body. We went north and touched the crumbling remains of mosaic pavements, the delicate stone fishes and twining grape clusters, and walked among the massive remains of temple walls and the more recent remains from Allenby's victories. We slept under Bedouin tents that stank of goat, in caves cut into the hillsides, on warm flat roofs under the stars, in feather beds in a pasha's palace, under an army lorry, under a fisherman's skiff, and under nothing but the sky. We drank cold, sour lemonade with Jews in a Zionist settlement, hot, syrupy mint tea with a Bedouin sheik, and Earl Grey with tinned milk in the house of a high-ranking army officer in Haifa. We bathed, far too seldom for my taste. There are drawbacks in being disguised as a male, and one of them is public bathing, in a bubbling spring above Cana of Galilee. 
in a smooth stretch of the Jordan surrounded by barbed wire under the disapproving gaze of a kingfisher, and in the tin hip bath of an English archaeologist in Jericho, whose passion for preserving her sight was matched only by her extreme Zionism. She was, incidentally, the only person I have ever met who, seeing me in disguise, knew me immediately and matter-of-factly for what I was. She greeted us with a furious barrage of words from the bottom of her trench, established that we were not about to carry off her beloved potsherds, marched us off to her remarkable home, which resembled a low Bedouin tent made of scrap wood and corrugated iron, and closeted me in a windowless room with concrete walls and an endless supply of gloriously hot water. Homes she allowed to sluice off under a bucket of cold water in the courtyard. We, I, left Jerusalem until nearly the end, circling around it on our way north, coming tantalizingly close twice and shying away, until finally we walked the long dry hills up to the city in the company of a group of Bedouins and their emaciated goats, and stood burnt black and footsore and absolutely filthy, even the normally cat-like homes, on the crest of Mount Olivet at sundown. There before us she rose up, the city of cities, the umbilicus mundi, centre of the universe, growing from the very foundations of the earth, surprisingly small like a jewel. My heart sang within me, and the ancient Hebrew came to my lips. Simhu et Yerushalayim vagilu bakol ohaveha. I recited, Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad for her, all you who love her. We watched the sun set and slept among the tombs overnight to the consternation of our guides, and in the morning we saw the sun lay tender arms around the city walls and bring her to brilliant, vibrant life. I rejoiced, and I was inexpressibly grateful. We sat until the sun set the white gold walls to blazing and dust rose from the road, and we went across and entered the city. For three days we walked her narrow streets, ate food from her bazaars, breathed the incense of her churches. We touched her walls and tasted her dust, and in the end we came away changed, to watch the winter sun relinquish her to the night. We then shouldered our packs and turned our backs on her. As the sky moved from thick cobalt to limitless black, we walked north, then stopped, made our two fires and pitched our three tents, drew water from a cistern, cooked and ate the inevitable tough goat's meat that seemed to be Ali and Mahmoud's staple diet, and drank tiny cups of Mahmoud's coffee, thick as honey and nearly as sweet, which he boiled and poured and we strained through our teeth. The fires burnt low, and our guides went to their beds, and in communicative silence Holmes and I respectively smoked and searched for constellations. When the embers had become mere flecks in the blackness, and the vault of the sky was pierced by a million points of hard white light, I was moved uncharacteristically to song, and with the warmth of the fire on the underside of my throat, I chanted to the stars the hymns of exile, the songs distilled from the longings of a people torn from their land, taken from the home of their god, and left to weep within the boundaries of the conqueror, Babylon, a hundred generations ago. My voice fell silent. On a distant hilltop, jackals set up their eerie chorus of yelps. Somewhere an engine rose, faded. A cock crew. Eventually, filled with that serenity that comes only with a decision reached or a task well completed, I rose to go to my tent. Holmes stretched out to knock his pipe bowl into the fire. I must thank you for bringing me here, Russell. It has been a most instructive interlude. There is one more place in this country that I wish to see, I told him. We shall pass through it on our way to Arca. Good night, Holmes. Two days later we sat atop a windy hill and looked out across the blood-soaked plain of Estraelan. 
General Allenby had caught the fleeing Turkish army here 15 months before. The Crusaders had met with calamitous defeat here 730 years earlier. Various armies across the last 3,000 years had struggled here for control over the narrow north-south passage that joins Egypt and Africa with the continents of Europe and Asia. The plains Mount Megiddo, Ar Megiddo, has given its name to the site of the ultimate battle. Armageddon will begin here. It is a crossroads, and it is fertile, a deadly combination. That evening, however, the only violence was the sound of a dog barking and the distant clamour of goat bells. Tomorrow we would begin to make our way to the Crusader fortress at Arca, where the boat was to meet us and carry us back to the cold of an English January and a resumption of our struggle against an unknown foe. A wearying prospect, seen while sitting here with the setting sun on our backs, the tents flapping gently in the breeze. The past weeks had been a thing apart, and only obliquely had we referred to the events that had driven us here. I knew that Holmes had chafed at being forced to allow others to do his footwork for him, even if the other was his brother Mycroft, but he had managed to control his impatience well. Finally, on that hillock overlooking the battleground, I reached out for the avoided topic and placed it firmly between us. So, Holmes, London awaits us. She does, Russell. She does indeed. There was a sudden light in his grey eyes that I had not seen in some weeks. The anticipation of a hound long denied the hunt, and I did not think the she referred to the city. What is your plan? He put his hand inside his dingy robes and withdrew his pipe and tobacco pouch. First tell me why you have brought us here. To Jezreel? I told you my mother's name, I believe. Yes, it was Judith, was it not? Not Mary McCarthy? Refresh my memory of the story, Russell. I try to forget things that I will not need in my work, and tales from the Bible normally fall into that category. I smiled grimly. Perhaps this is one story you may see a use for, Holmes. It is one my mother and I read when I was seven. She was the granddaughter of a rabbi, a small woman, quiet, possessed of a remarkable wisdom. Although the story is apocryphal rather than from the Hebrew canon, she chose this as the first story we studied together because she did not believe that religion should be an easy thing. Also, it involves her namesake. The Judith and Holofernes story? It happened here, or at any rate the story was set here, in a small town astride the Jerusalem road that we have just come up. Holofernes was the commander of an army from out of the north, sent to punish Jerusalem. This little town barred his way, so he cut off its water and laid siege to it. After thirty-four days, the townspeople gave God an ultimatum. Provide water within five days, or we stand aside, and Jerusalem can have this army. Judith, a wise, upstanding, wealthy young widow, was disgusted with them. She put on her richest clothes, summoned her maid, and left the town to walk out to Holofernes' camp. She told him she wished to be saved from the coming destruction, and paraded herself around in front of him for a few days. He, of course, invited her to his tent. She got him drunk, he passed out, and she cut off his head and took it back with her to the town. The invasion fell apart, Jerusalem was saved, and two and a half thousand years later women named for her gave their children nightmares with the story. A stimulating tale, Russell, though hardly one that I should choose for a seven-year-old. My mother believed in starting theological training early. The following year we did the Levite's concubine, which makes the Judith story sound like a nursery rhyme. Still, that is why I wanted to come here, to see where Holofernes arrayed his troops. Does that answer your question? He sighed. I am afraid so. Then you did see what I was thinking on the boat. I could hardly miss it. And you offer this as an alternative? 
he waved one hand at the darkening plain. Yes. I would not consider the implications. Not until I had to. No. I am sorry, Russell, but I will not have you place yourself within the enemy camp. I do not believe that you would find this opponent of ours an obliging drunkard. I won't be sacrificed, though, Holmes. I refuse to abandon you. I was relieved. But all the same, I would not be a coward. I am not suggesting that you abandon me, Russell. Only that you appear to do so. He rose and went to his tent and came back with a familiar wooden box in his hand. He set out the pieces as they had been in the game we had played off Crete before my queen had fallen. He then turned the board around to take possession of the black. This time it was I who captured his queen, I who pressed and chivered him into a corner. The game shifted, however, for I knew his intentions and refused to be drawn in. The moves lengthened, slowed, as our two diminutive armies clashed. Pieces fell and were removed from the field of battle. The first stars emerged unnoticed. Ali brought over a small oil lamp and set it on a rock between us. And Holmes laid a pincer's movement that took my second bishop. I took a rook, a hollow victory. Holmes scorned their stolid directness. And two moves later lost one to his knight. Holmes's knights were terrible weapons when a certain mood was upon him more like Boa de Seer's bladed chariot with its wholesale mowing down of men than a proper knight on horseback. Mahmoud pressed tiny cups of syrupy coffee into our hands, watched the board for a time without comment, and went off. It was a long game. I knew that he intended to duplicate my surprise victory when I allowed the queen to fall in order to set up a trap in the hands of the commoners, but I refused to be manoeuvred. I drew him out. I kept away from his pawns and used my queen with great caution, and eventually he seemed to change his tactics and laid another triangle of pincers to drive me into. I danced away from it. He relayed it farther back on the board. Again I avoided it and sent my remaining rook down to place him into check. He evaded it. I brought up my queen in support and then somehow in the excitement of closing in I overlooked the board in front of me and the pawn that had been a weak man in the first long-forgotten pincer's movement was in my second rank, and then it was before me, newly born a queen. Regina Redaviva, Holmes commented sardonically and proceeded to tear into the unprotected backside of my offence like a hailstorm through peach blossoms. I fell before his resurrected queen in a complete rout, was mated in half a dozen moves, and then it was my turn to laugh quietly and shake my head before I sobered. Holmes, she'll never fall for it, I objected. She will, you know, if the distraction is believable enough. The woman is proud and scornful, and her anger at our absence will make her incautious and all too willing to believe that Sherlock Holmes has failed to preserve his queen, that poor old Holmes stands alone, exposed and helpless. He reached out and rocked the crown of the Black King with the tip of his finger. She will swoop in to pick me off, he tapped the White Queen. And then we have her. He picked up the Black Pawn and rolled it around in his hands as if to warm it. And when he opened his hands, the black queen lay there. He put her back onto the board and sat back with the air of a man concluding a lengthy and delicate business negotiation. It is good, he pronounced. Really very good. His eyes gleamed in the last flicker of the lamp's wick with a curious, intense relish such as I had seen on his face the week before when he was facing a young assailant with a large knife. Joie de combat, I supposed, and my heart quailed before this changed Holmes. It's dangerous, Holmes, I protested, really very dangerous. What if she sees what we're doing? 
What if she doesn't play by the rules and just decides to wipe us both out? What if... What if I fail? A voice wailed inside me. What if, what if? Of course it's dangerous, Russell. But I can hardly spend the rest of my life rusticating in Palestine or tripping over bodyguards, can I? He sounded quite pleased about it. But now that the time had come, I wanted to hide. We don't know what she'll do, I cried. At least let Lestrade provide some guards at the beginning. Or Mycroft, if you don't want Scotland Yard in on it, until we know how she's going to react. We may as well put an advertisement in the Times to inform her of our intentions, he scoffed. You ought to take up fencing, Russell. Truly you should. It offers the most instructive means of judging your adversary. You see, Russell, I have a feel for my opponent now. I know her style and her reach. She has made some points off me in the game thus far, but she has also revealed her own faults. Her attacks have all been patterned on her perception of my nature, my skill at the game. When we return, she will expect me to continue dodging and parrying with my customary subtlety and skill. She knows that I will do so, but I shall not. Instead, I shall foolishly lure my blade and walk unguarded into her. She will stand back for a moment to see what I am doing. She will be suspicious then gradually convinced of my madness, then gloating before she strikes. But you, Russell... He swept his robed arm over the board, and when he drew it back, the Black Queen stood in the place of the White Bolt and Nut King. You will be waiting for her all the time, and you will strike first. Dear God, I had wanted more responsibility, and here it was, with a vengeance. I worked to control my voice. Holmes, it is no false modesty to say that I haven't the experience in this... this game, as you insist on calling it. A mistake on my part could be fatal. We must have a backup. I shall think about it, he said finally. And then he leant forward over the chessboard and looked into my eyes with that same curious intensity that he had shown earlier. However, I want you to realise, Russell, that I know your abilities better than you do. After all, I have trained you. For nearly four years I have shaped you and tempered you and honed you, and I know the metal you are made from. I know your strengths and weaknesses, particularly after these last weeks. The things we have done in this country have honed you, but the steel was there to begin with. I do not regret my decision to come here with you, Russell. If you truly feel that you cannot do this, then I shall accept that decision. I will not consider it a failure on your part. It will merely mean that you join Watson while I enlist Mycroft's help. It would be inferior, I admit, inelegant, and I think long, but not hopeless. It is, however, your choice entirely. His words were placid, but what lay beneath them shook me breathless, for what he was proposing would in another man be sheer recklessness. Holmes the painstaking, Holmes the thoughtful, calculating thinker, Holmes the solitary operator who never so much as consulted another for advice. This Holmes I thought I knew was now proposing to launch himself into the abyss, trusting absolutely in my ability to catch him. And more even than that. This self-contained individual, this man who had rarely allowed even his sturdy ex-army companion Watson to confront real risk, who had habitually over the past four years held back being cautious, kept an eye out, and otherwise protected me, this man who was a Victorian gentleman down to his boots, this man was now proposing to place not only his life and limb into my untested, inexperienced, and above all, female hands, but my own life as well. This was the change I had noticed in him and puzzled about, the intensity and relish with which he was facing the coming combat. There was no hesitation left. He had let go all doubt, 
and was telling me in crystal clear terms that he was prepared to treat me as his complete, full and unequivocal equal, if that was what I wished. He was giving me not only his life, but my own. I had long known the intellect of this man, been aware for nearly as long of his humanity and the greatness of his heart, but I had never had demonstrated to me so clearly that the size of his spirit was equal to his mind. The knowledge rumbled through me like an earthquake, and in its wake a small voice echoed, wondering if I had just pronounced his epitaph. I don't know how long it was before I looked up from the small carved queen into the carved-looking features of the man across from me. But when I did, it seemed that his eyebrows were waiting for something. I had to think for a moment before I realised that he had actually asked a question. But there was no decision to be made. When faced with the unthinkable, I said shakily, one chooses the merely impossible. He smiled approvingly, warmly. And then a miracle happened. Holmes reached out his long arms to me, and like a frightened child I went inside them, and he held me awkwardly at first, then more easily, until my trembling faded. I sat, safe, listening to the steady beat of his heart, until the oil lamp gutted out and left us in darkness. Two days later the crusader walls of Arca closed in on us, as unlike the sun-swept stones of Jerusalem eighty miles away as could be imagined. Jerusalem's golden walls had sparkled and shone, and the city vibrated with an inaudible song of joy and pain. But Arca's walls were heavy and thick, and its song was a multilingual dirge of ignorance and death. The long shadows seemed like spectres to be avoided, and I noticed Holmes glancing about him sharply. Ali and Mahmud, in their customary place four strides ahead of us, seemed as unaware of the gloom as they were of anything outside themselves. But even they edged towards the middle of the streets, as if the walls were unclean. I tried to push away the mood, but it crept back stubbornly. I wonder if these stones would speak with such a bleak voice if I didn't know what the place stood for, I said to Holmes irritably. To a mind attuned to observation and deduction, the product reveals the mind of its creator. He squinted up at the great ponderous blocks that loomed up to hide the sky and rubbed his hands together slowly. Take Mozart, frenzied gaiety and weeping put to music. The agony of the man is at times unbearable. Let us go. We made our way through the streets down to the water, and when we turned a final corner, Ali and Mahmoud had disappeared. I felt shockingly naked without those two swathed backs billowing along in front of me, heads together. But Holmes just smiled and nudged me ahead. As we went past a wooden door set into a wall, he spoke into the air. Marhaba, he said, and to my surprise added, Allah ma. I echoed his thanks and the blessing, and we went on to the edge of the water, and we sat drinking mint tea from a nearby stall and watched the waves rub at the remnants of the Crusader Pier until dark, when we were found by the crew member who had taken us ashore at Jaffa the month before. Our backs were to the fortress as he rowed us noiselessly towards the waiting boat, our faces turned to England. We stood on the deck, and watched the last lights of Palestine fade. Jerusalem was hidden from sight, but to my eyes there was a faint glow in the southeast, as of stored sunlight. I recited under my breath, Al Naharot Babel, Sham Yashavnu Gam Bakinu, Im Ishkachek Yerushalayim Tishkrach Yamini. 
You sang that the other night, did you not? asked Holmes. What is it? A psalm. One of the more powerful Hebrew songs, full of sibilants and gutturals. I translated it for him. By the waters of Babylon, where we lay down and wept when we remembered Zion, we hung up our lyres, for our captors required songs of us, and our tormentors demanded mirth. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand wither, may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth, if I do not remember you. Amen, he murmured surprising me again. The land receded to a smear of lights against greater darkness, and we went below. Book Four, Mastery. Battle is joined. Chapter 14. The Act Begins. Isolate her, and however abundant the food or favourable the temperature, she will expire in a few days, not of hunger or cold, but of loneliness. The ship's engines picked up in pitch even before we reached the common cabin, and the powerful movement beneath our feet told of some speed. I made for the bath, and gratefully shed my dust-thick, sweat-stiff, pungent, threadbare clothing. One hour and three changes of water later, I arose transformed, my nails pink and white, my hair freed at last from its concealing wraps, my skin tingling and alive. I slipped on the long embroidered kaftan I had bought in the souk in Nablus, and feeling positively sensuous as I glided across the floor, a female again in my loose clothing after weeks of squatting, striding and scratching, I went to make a large pot of English tea. Holmes had bathed elsewhere and sat reading the Times, dressed in a clean shirt and dressing gown, as if he had never gone unshaven, never slept wrapped in goatskins, never concerned himself with the local fauna taking up residence in his scalp. I picked up a delicate bone china cup and laughed silently in sheer delight. There came a knock at the door, and the captain's voice, "'Good evening, Mr. Holmes,' I heard. Permission to enter? Come in, Jones, come in. I trust you had a satisfactory stay in Palestine, sir, the captain said. Simple pleasures for simple minds, Holmes murmured. His words actually startled the good captain into a reaction, causing him to run an experienced eye over the fading green-yellow bruises on Holmes's face and glance for a moment at the neat bandage peeking out from the sleeve of my caftan. He even went so far as to open his mouth on a comment. But before he could lose control so completely, he made a visible effort, snapped his jaws shut, and then turned to close the door. Holmes glanced at me with an expression that looked suspiciously like mischief. "'And you, Captain Jones,' he said. "'I hope you have had a successful January, though I see you haven't spent too much of it aboard ship. How was France? Rebuilding already, I see?' Silence fell, and as I came out of the galley, I saw a familiar look of wary perplexity on the captain's face. How do you know where I've been? Oh, sorry. Evening, miss. He touched his cap. No major, Mr. Jones. Your skin tells me that you've spent no great time in the sun since you left us, and your new hair pomade and the watch on your wrist tell me you have spent a day in Paris. Don't worry he said with a chuckle. I haven't had spies on you, just my own eyes. I'm glad to hear that, Mr. Holmes. If I thought you'd been nosing about, I'd be forced to have some gentleman ask you a few hard questions. Not to offend, sir. It'd just be my job. I understand, Jones, and I am careful to see only those things that tell me of unimportant activities. That's probably for the best, sir. Oh, yes. This packet is for you. It was sent by a courier from London last week into my own hands. In Paris, in fact. I was standing close to him and reached out for it, but Holmes's voice cut in, sharp, scathing, and utterly authoritative. 
not to Miss Russell Jones. This and any future official conveyances will be delivered personally to me and me alone. Do you understand, Captain Jones? In the cabin's shocked silence, Holmes rose and walked forward, coldly took the packet from the captain's hand and went to open it by the window. Jones stared at his back for a moment, then looked at me in open amazement. A flush of shame crept into my face, and I turned abruptly and went into my cabin, slamming the door. A minute later I heard the outer door close behind the captain. We had begun our play. In a few minutes I heard two light taps on my door. I stood and went to the window before responding. Come in, Holmes. Russell, this packet is most... Ah, I see. The mind was willing, but the heart taken aback, I take it. How he could discern my distress from looking at my spine, I cannot think. No. No, it was just the suddenness of it took me unawares. I turned to face him. I was not expecting to begin the act so quickly. However, perhaps it is for the best. The captain is now aware that something is amiss, and I doubt that I could have acted that particular scene. I'm not exactly Sarah Bernhardt. My smile was a bit forced. It was indeed most convincing. I fear there will be any number of painful moments before this act is over. The lines are written, we must speak them, I said dismissively. Now, what were you saying about Mycroft's packet? Here, look for yourself. Our adversary has been most prudent. I am filled with admiration for her technique. Were it not that she presses so close in on me, I should relish this case greatly, for I cannot remember one in which such a large number of clues led absolutely nowhere. I think I shall go and fill my pipe. The packet was a thick one. I put aside for later reading the five fat envelopes with Mrs. Hudson's writing and stamps from various ports of call and looked at Mycroft's offering. Numerous pages from the laboratories at Scotland Yard described the prints on the cab, the button with its attached bit of tweed, and the analysis of the three bombs, one in grisly detail. It was the description of the hive bomb that illuminated the most, and in fact changed the entire picture. The investigation had found that the charge was ignited not by Holmes's clumsiness, but by a hair-thin wire that ran from the hive he had been checking, hidden beneath the grass, to the bomb in the next hive. Mycroft's men had found it in the wreckage. She never meant to kill you, then? I was glad to see that. The problem had troubled me. Oh, not her murder attempt, but that mine was the first. The whole point of killing you and Watson, as I read it, was to hurt me. But how could I be hurt by your deaths if I were already dead? I was very pleased to see that explained by the trigger. It also confirms that you shall be safe if we appear alienated. I shall have to arrange for a discreet guard for Mrs. Hudson when she returns from Australia. But Watson's protection we shall continue to leave to Mycroft. The rest of the pages were interesting, but not as important as the fact of the wire trigger. The prints on the intact Oxford bomb were those of the deceased man and his alone. The cab's prints included those of Holmes, myself and Billy, its owner and another driver, both of whom Lestrade had interviewed and released, and two others, one of whom had a thumbprint matching the one on the button. This gentleman was well known to the police record books and was soon apprehended. His colleague made an escape out the back window of his house and was rumoured to have fled to America. The large man in custody was being charged with all the injuries done to Billy and to the cab, but Lestrade was of the opinion that the man would not be threatened into revealing anything concerning his employer. He does not appear frightened of retribution, wrote Lestrade, simply very firm in his refusal, despite threats of a long prison term for the assault. It should be noted that his wife and their two teenage sons have recently moved into a new house and seem to have an income from outside. Their bank account does not reflect any great change, but they have significant quantities of cash to spend. Thus far, inquiries have been without result. 
I looked up at Holmes through his cloud of grey smoke. We have another family man in our group, I see. Read on. The plot thickens quickly. The Yard's next document concerned the dead man, John Dixon, who had bombed Dr. Watson's house. He had indeed been apparently reformed, living happily to all appearances, with his wife and children, and working in his father-in-law's music business. About six weeks before the trio of bombs, he had come into a comfortable inheritance from a distant relative who had died in New York. According to his widow, he had told her that the inheritance was to be in two parts, of equal size, the second to be received within four or five months. He began talking about university for the young children, and the surgery one of them needed on a crippled leg, and they planned a trip to France the following summer. However, shortly after the first sum of money arrived, he began to become secretive. He put a lock on a back shed and spent hours in there. The investigation revealed traces of the explosive powder used and clipped ends of wire, such as the Oxford bomb had preserved. He disappeared, occasionally for one or two days, returning travel-stained and weary, but oddly excited. He had left the house on a Saturday night in the middle of December, saying that he should be away for several days, but that after this trip he should not have to leave again. The wife and her father tried to persuade him not to go, it being a very busy time of year for the shop, but he was adamant. In the early hours of Thursday morning he was killed by the bomb, apparently a result of the timing mechanism having been tampered with. One week later, a bank draft was received in the wife's name, drawn from a bank in New York. Police there found that the account had been opened some weeks before by a woman who had brought in cash for the purpose. An odd afternote was that the amount of the second payment was exactly twice what the first had been, rather than an equal amount, as Dixon had anticipated. The two drafts depleted the account, which was closed. The Strad concluded by noting that although it was irregular, there was no way to prove that the money was connected to the bombing. Therefore, it looked as though the widow would be allowed to keep it. What do you make of that second payment, Holmes? Guilt pangs? Cleanliness has affected your brain, Russell. Clearly, the murder was premeditated. Yes, of course. The original amount was what had been planned for, but possibly not by Dixon. Make a note, Russell, to ask Lestrade about Dixon's state of mind at the time of death. You are thinking that it might have been suicide? In exchange for a payment to the family? Whatever it is, it adds an interesting facet to our foe's personality. She is a person with international connections or so the large quantity of American currency would tend to indicate. Yet she carries through on her agreement with a dead man. On top of everything else we know about her, she's a murderer with a sense of honour. Most subtle. I returned to the package, which included a faint carbon copy of the bomb report, highly technical and couched in police English, several large glossy photographs of the cab, and the ladies, and a letter from Mycroft. I glanced at the first, set aside the photographs, and began to read Mycroft's cramped but remarkably impersonal handwriting. The first part of the letter was concerned with a bomb. He agreed that it had been Dixon's work, adding that although the toggle detonator had been manufactured in America before 1909, it had apparently been exposed to London's corrosive air for some many months. He went on to address the problem of the marksman who had shot at us in Scotland Yard, who may or may not have been the same gentleman whom the mother pushing her pram across the bridge had witnessed bundling an elaborate contraption like a street photographer's camera, complete with hood, and in this case wheels, into the back seat of a waiting taxicab and squealing off. Concerning this, he wrote... I perceive a distinct odour of red herring, as with the fleeing steam launch, which we discovered was hired, anonymously with cash, 
to make off at all speed, immediately the captain heard a sound like a shot. Concerning the identity of your lady pursuer, continued Mycroft, very little has appeared, but for the following. Three days ago, on my way to the club, an unbelievably unsavoury character, with the physiognomy of a toad and something of the colour, sidled up to me in a manner meant, no doubt, to appear casual, and muttered out of the corner of his flat lips that he had a message for my brother. I do wish that you might arrange for these persons to send letters. I suppose they are illiterate. Might they be instructed in the use of the telephone? The sum total of his message was, and I quote, Lefty says there's Glasgow Rangers with buckets of bees in town. The pitch and toss is somebody's trouble. End quote. I thought this might be of interest to you. Incidentally, heartiest congratulations on the success of your Palestinian episode. No more than I expected from you, but the minister and the PM are immensely grateful. I suppose that when your name finds its way onto next year's list, you will wish me to arrange for its removal. This becomes tedious, and I gather that before too long I shall be doing the same for Miss Russell. I trust this finds you and your companion well. I anticipate your return with something of the eager interest of a fox outside a henhouse into which he has seen saunter a cat. Mycroft. I tore my eyes from the intimations of the penultimate paragraph and looked up from the missive. Glasgow Rangers? Buckets of bees? Cockney rhyming slang. Strangers with a great deal of money, bees and honey, and the boss is somebody's trouble and strife. Wife. A woman. I nodded thoughtfully, put down the letter, and took up the photographs to lay them out on the low table in front of the sofa, and began to study them carefully. The photographer had taken two full sets of the interior of the cab, the first as it had been originally, the second after I had removed my scraps. With a pang I remembered the pleasure the green silk dress had brought me as I saw a portion of its cuff in one photograph. What was the point of this destruction, Holmes? Why attack the clothes and not us? Even Billy wasn't badly hurt, just parked to one side. Do you mind if I open the window a bit? It is a bit thick in here, isn't it? That's good. Better close it in a minute or two, though. We don't want our voices heard. Why, indeed, as you say, might a foe be content with a few clothes and the seat cushions of an old cab? except to show us that she knew where we were, and that she could as easily have done the same to our bodies as your clothes, and finally to thumb her nose at me by pulling my own trick of leaving reversed footsteps and topping it off with Baker Street mud. It was a demonstration, no doubt about that. But was that all? I think not. Look closely at the slashes on the seats there. He arranged the last set of photographs so that they overlapped, to place the seat in a continuous line. Do you see something? I looked at the shredded seats. The cuts that crossed met at their lower ends and ran parallel. I laid my spectacles to one side and squinted hard at the clear black and grey images. Is there a pattern? I asked, hearing the excitement in my voice. Hand me that pencil and pad, would you, Holmes? The first two cuts crossed each other in the middle, and I wrote an X on my pad. The next two met at the lower edge of the seat, a V. After some minutes and discussion with Holmes, I had a string of Xs, Vs, and straight lines on my pad. Roman numerals? I wondered. Does this mean anything to you? I asked Holmes whose steely eyes were studying the page intently. I could see that it did not, so I put on my glasses and sat back. A string of twenty-five Roman numbers. Do they add up to something? I did the simple sum in my head. Ten plus five plus ten, and so on. One hundred forty-five, if they make up twenty-five separate numbers. Of course, they could say 15, 17, 22, 12, and so forth. 
What would that come to? There won't be much difference, because of the nature of Roman numerals. But it comes to, let's see, 143. Interesting. And the number between them is 144. A dozen dozen. And the two sums added together make 288, which is the number of dollars my father had in his desk when he died. Holmes, these number games could go on forever. What if we translated the numbers into letters, one of the more simplistic codes? We scribbled and thought, but came up with nothing. Reading it as 15, 17, 22, 12, 22, 24, 20, 11, yielded gibberish as OQVLVXTK, and no other combination made any sense either. I finally pushed it away. There are just too many variables, Holmes. Without a key, we can't even know if it's a word, or the combination to a safe, or a map coordinate, or... Yet she left it for us to find. Where could she have put the key? Judging from her previous style, I should say that the key is both hidden and completely obvious, which is always the most effective means of hiding something. It was very late now, and my eyes felt gritty. I picked up the conversation where we had left it before the slash pattern had appeared. I agree that she was demonstrating her cleverness. She won a number of points in that round. I wonder what her next move might have been had we not been spirited away by Mycroft. Cutting off Watson's nose to show that she could have taken his head? More to the point, what will her move be now when we walk openly home? For how long will her weariness last before she thinks it is perhaps not a trap? That we truly are divided and the trauma of it has made me an empty wreck? Mere extermination is not what she wants, apparently. She wishes to ruin me first. Very well. We'll give her that and wait for her to move. He carefully inserted the papers and photographs back into their oversized envelope and stood looking down at me. Well, Russell, thank you for showing me Palestine. It may be a long, long time before we are able to speak freely. I shall say good night and goodbye, and we will meet when the prey takes the bait and comes into our trap. His lips gently brushed my forehead, and he was gone. Thus began our act of alienation. Holmes and I had only a few days to perfect our roles of the two friends now turned against each other, the father and daughter alienated. The near lovers become bitterest, most implacable of enemies. It takes time to develop a part, as all actors know, time and an exploration of the nuances and quirks of the person being played. We had to be word perfect before we reached England for the trap to be effective. We had to assume that we were being watched at every moment, and a slight slip of affection could be disastrous. It is a truism of the actor's art that one can play only oneself on the stage. To be fully effective, the actor must have a sympathy for the character's motives, however unsympathetic they may appear to an outsider. To a large extent, the actor must become the character if the act is to be effective. And that is what Holmes and I did. From the time we rose in the morning, we did not play enemies. We were enemies. When we met, it was with icy politeness that rapidly disintegrated into vicious attacks. I grew into the role of the young student who had come to view her old teacher with withering scorn. Holmes responded with malevolent counterattacks and the full strength of his razor-sharp sarcasm. We cut each other with our tongues and bled and crawled off to the sanctuary of our individual cabins and came back for more. The first day was technically difficult, keeping up the persona in front of my real face, continually thinking, what might I do at this point if I really were this way? And how ought I to respond to that? It was exhausting, and I went to bed early. The second day it quickly became easier. 
Holmes never looked out from behind his mask, and mine too was now firmly in place. I went to my room early to read, but found it difficult to concentrate. My mind wandered off. What on earth was I doing here? I ought to be in Oxford, not on this boat. I had no business taking off this time of year. Even basic work was impossible in this battleground. Perhaps the captain might let me off in France, and I could take the train home. Probably be faster and certainly more restful. I wonder... I jerked to attention, horrified. These were not the thoughts of an actor. This was the character thinking. I had become, for a moment, the person I had played throughout the day. I sat appalled at the implications. If this could happen after less than 48 hours of play-acting, what would happen after days and weeks of it? Would I be able to shut it off at will? Oh, my God, would it become a habit too firm to break? For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life? Wouldn't a nice clean bomb be better than losing homes? A malevolent voice seemed to murmur beneath the engine throb. If I forget thee, Jerusalem, may my right hand lose its cunning. I went out into the common room for some brandy, and Holmes passed me silently as he went into his room. I stood in the dark, looking out at the black sea until the glass was empty, and went back to the hallway. Holmes had left his door slightly ajar, and my steps slowed. I stopped, and let my shoulder and head come to rest against the wall, not looking in at the segment of his room that was available to my eyes. Holmes? Yes, Russell? Holmes, when you have acted a part for some days, do you find it hard to drop it? It can be difficult to shake off a part, yes. His voice was calm, conversational. When I spent a week working on the docks on a case many years ago, the day after the man was arrested, I dressed and went out at the usual time and walked clear down to Oxford Street before I came to myself. Yes, a part can become habitual. Had you not realized that risk? Not completely. You are doing well, Russell. It becomes easier as time passes. That is precisely what I am afraid of, Holmes, I whispered. How long before the part becomes so natural that it is no longer a part? How am I to maintain my objectivity, to watch for signs that the opponent is opening herself up if I become the part? When the time comes, you will do it. I have faith in you, Russ. His easy words brought me an element of stability, calm within the storm. I am glad you have faith in me, Holmes, I said dryly. I bow to your superior experience. I could feel his smile through the door. I shall send you messages from time to time while you are up at Oxford. Obvious ones for the most part, though if I have the opportunity to send a secure one, I shall do so. You, of course, will write occasionally to Mrs. Hudson when she returns from Australia, and she will leave the letters lying about pointedly. You think it will be safe to allow her to return to Sussex? I do not know how I should keep her away. Mycroft had practically to kidnap her to get her on the ship in the first place. Mrs. Hudson is a very determined woman. No, we shall simply have to take on one or two extra servants. Mycroft's agents, of course. Poor Mrs. Hudson. She'll be so upset when she finds we've quarrelled. Yes, but Mycroft will be a safe liaison. There's no hiding anything from Mycroft. I fear our alienation will also cause considerable pain to Dr. Watson. I can only hope it will not wind on for too many months. You think it could go on so long? Oh, God. I believe our foe is a careful and patient individual. 
She will not act precipitously. You are right, as usual. Your aunt will be pleased, I fear. Your farm, of course, will necessitate the occasional trip to Sussex. No doubt it will. I thought for a moment. Holmes, an automobile might come of considerable use in this adventure. However, I can no longer borrow money from Mrs. Hudson, and I doubt that my aunt would approve the expenditure. My allowance goes up this year, but not enough for that. I think Mycroft should be of help there, in persuading your trustees and the university offices that an automobile is a necessary item. You may even come to my farm once or twice, in attempts at reconciliation. Which will, of course, fail. Of course. I imagined the quick smile flitting across his features. This is a good trap we're constructing, Russell. Strong and simple. It only needs patience, patience and alertness to the praise movements. We will catch her, Russell. She's no match for us. Go to sleep now. I believe I will. Thank you, Holmes. I did go to bed, and eventually to sleep. But in the still hours that are neither night nor morning, the dream came for me with a greater force than it had had in years. I came up from it to find myself huddled on the floor with my arms over my head, a shriek of complete hopelessness and terror echoing off the walls. All the old symptoms washed over me, cold, copious sweat, sour vomit in the back of my throat, heart bursting, lungs heaving. Then the door was flung open, and Holmes was kneeling beside me with his strong hands on my shoulders. Russell, what is it? Go away. Go away. Leave me alone. My voice was harsh and hurt my throat. I stood up and nearly fell, and his hands helped me to my bed. I sat with my head in my hands, pushing the dream back into its box, my body slowing. Over the pounding in my veins, I was peripherally aware that Holmes was still beside me, tying the belt of his dressing gown, smoothing his hair back from his temples with both hands, and drilling the back of my skull with his gaze. Eventually he left off and went out of the room, but he did not close the door, and was back after a minute with a glass in one hand and his tobacco pouch in the other. He held out the glass. Drink this. To my surprise, it was not brandy, but water. Cool, sweet water. Sweeter than honey wine. I put the empty glass on the table with hands that were almost steady and shivered from the drying sweat. Thank you, Holmes. Sorry I woke you. Again. You can go back to bed now. Pull the bedclothes over you, Russell. You'll take cold. I'll just sit for a moment, if you don't mind. He brought a chair around to the head of my bed and sat down, crossed his pyjama-clad legs and took out his pipe. And I curled up and listened to the old familiar sounds of a pipe being filled and lit, the scrape and tap as he cleaned the bowl, the rustle of the tobacco pouch, the rattle of the matchbox, the quick scratch and flare of the match lighting, the suck of air drawing and several quick puffs of his lips around the stem, the sharp smell of sulphur and the sweet wash of pipe tobacco filled the air, and Holmes sat and smoked, unobtrusively, undemandingly. My wits gradually returned from the realm of Pan, and as they had a thousand times before, turned to the dream. This upwelling of my subconscious had driven me to the works of Freud and Jung and the others of the European schools of psychoanalytic theory. Countless hours of self-hypnosis, self-analysis, dream symbolism. I had analysed it, dissected it, thrown the full force of my mind against it. I even tried ignoring it. No matter what the approach, eventually there came another night when I was flung again into the hell 
and the agony of the thing. The one thing I refused to try was telling someone about it. One morning my aunt had become too persistent in her questions about my nightmares, and I had hit her in the face and knocked her to the floor. My neighbours in lodgings had commented on my nocturnal disturbances, and I had passed it off as studying too hard. The thought of telling someone, and having to see their face afterward, had always clamped my mouth down on the words. But now, to my exquisite horror and relief, I heard the words trickle from my mouth. Slowly at first, inexorably, they pushed themselves into the dim room. My brother. My brother was a genius. Reading by three, complex geometry by five. His potential was huge. He was nine when he died. Five years younger than I. And I, I, killed him. My harsh voice faded, leaving the low sound of engines and the burble of the pipe. No reaction from Holmes. I turned onto my back and put my arm across my eyes, as if the hall light hurt them. But in truth, it was that I couldn't bear to see his face as I told him this. I have this... this dream. Only it's not a dream. It's a memory. Every minute, tedious, horrible detail of it. We were in a car, you see, driving along the coast south of San Francisco. My father was going into the army the following week. He had been rejected because of his bad leg, but finally he persuaded them to put him into... I laughed bitterly. You could guess this, I think. Into intelligence work. We were taking a last family weekend at our cabin in the woods, but I was... being difficult, as my mother put it. I was fourteen, and had wanted to go with some school friends to Yosemite, but I had to go to the cabin instead. My brother was being particularly beastly. My mother was upset over Dad leaving, and Dad was distracted by business and the army. A merry company, you see. Well, the road is bad there, and at several places it runs along the top of some cliffs over the Pacific, a drop of a couple hundred feet. To make a long story short... We were just coming up to one of these, with a blind corner to the left at the top of it, when I started screaming at my brother. My father turned around at the wheel to tell us to shut up, and the car drifted across the centre. There was another car coming around the corner, going very fast, and it hit us. Our car spun around, I was thrown out, and the last I saw was the outline of my brother's head through the back window as the car went over the side. Dad had just filled the petrol tank. There was nothing left of them. Any of them. They scraped together enough pieces for the funeral. Silence. How could I possibly have thought it right to tell Holmes this? I was empty, dead. The world was filled with a howling wind and the gnashing of teeth. The dream had escaped my control. My past had freed itself to destroy me and the, yes, I would admit it, love. The thin wail of my mother's voice as the car went over. I had for this man. I went crazy for a while, kept having to be restrained from throwing myself off things. I finally came across a very good psychiatrist. She told me that the only way I could make up for it was not to kill myself, but to make myself worth something. In effect, though she didn't say it so simply, to be my brother's stand-in. It was an effective piece of therapy, in a way. I no longer tried to jump from high places. But the dream started that same week. Holmes cleared his throat. How often does it come? Not often now. I haven't had it since we were in Wales. I thought it was finally gone. It appears not. 
I've never told anyone about it, ever. I lay there and thought of the time just before I left California that Dr. Ginsburg drove me down to the cliffs, and I had seen the sparkle of glass and the scorch marks below, and how tempting and welcoming and cool the waves looked as they pounded themselves to froth on the rocks far below. Russell, I... I interrupted him with a desperate rush of words. If you're going to reassure me that it wasn't my fault and say that I mustn't feel guilty about it, Holmes, I'd rather you left, because that really would finish us off. Truly, it would. No, Russ, I wasn't about to say that. Give me some credit, I beg you. Of course you killed them. It was not murder or even manslaughter. But you are certainly guilty of provoking a fatal accident. That will remain on your hands. I could not believe what I was hearing. I took my arm away and looked at him then, and saw in his face a mirror image of the pain I could feel on my own. Only in his case the rawness of it was smoothed over, soothed by wisdom and years. I was merely going to say that I hope you realize that guilt is a poor foundation for a life without other motivations beside it. His gentle words shook me like an earthquake, like the tremor I had felt as the gout of flame came bubbling up over the cliff. I felt myself falling into a chasm that yawned up within me, and all that held me was a pair of calm grey eyes. Gradually the trembling stopped, the earth subsided, the chasm fell in on itself and closed, and the eyes saw it all and understood. My guilt, the secret that had gnawed at me day and night for four years, was in the open now, recognised and acknowledged, and no longer would it be swept away to grow malignantly in the dark. My guilt had been admitted. I had been convicted, had done my penance, and had been given absolution and told to move on. The healing process could begin. For the first time, for the very first time since I had awakened surrounded by white coats and the smell of the hospital, a sob tore into my chest. I saw it on the face of the man opposite me, and I closed my eyes and I wept. The following morning we resumed our roles, all signs of the night's revelations banished. It was bearable now, because that night and each successive night after the lights were turned out, I would hear two taps at the door and Holmes would enter, stay for a few minutes and leave. We spoke of quiet things, mostly concerning my studies. Twice I lit a candle and read to him from the little Hebrew Bible I had bought in the old bazaar in Jerusalem. Once, after a particularly bitter day of verbal duels and bloodletting, he sat and stroked my hair until I fell asleep. These moments made sanity possible. From the time I rose in the morning until I turned off my light, Holmes was my enemy, and the ship rang with our fury, and the men retreated from the ice that spread from us. At night, however, for a few minutes, battle was suspended, and, like the British and German soldiers exchanging cigarettes and carols across no man's land during the undeclared Christmas truce of 1914, we could put away the battle and fraternise. Two weary and seasoned veterans. I grew in strength and pride, and, while the weather held, spent hours on the deck reading, turning darker yet, my hair almost bleached white. Holmes, on the other hand, drew in. His scathing attacks began to reveal an undertone of bewilderment and pain, an emotional reaction that his pride would not allow him to show to the world. He rarely left his cabin, where the lights burned at all hours. His plates were returned untouched, 
and he smoked vast quantities of his filthy black shag tobacco. When the supplies ran low, he resumed the habit of cigarettes, which he had left some years before. He drank heavily, never showing the slightest sign of its effect, and I suspected he would have returned to his cocaine had he been able to get it. He looked ghastly, with a strange yellow tinge beneath his tan, his eyes bloodshot and rimmed in red, his normally thin frame on the edge of emaciation. One night I objected. Holmes, there's not much point in this elaborate farce if you kill yourself before she has a chance. Or are you trying to save her the trouble? It is not as bad as it looks, Russell, I assure you. You look jaundiced, Holmes, which means your liver is failing, and your eyes tell me you haven't slept in several days. I was startled to feel my bunk shaking, and then realised that he was laughing softly. So the old man has a few tricks left, does he? Russell, I discovered a large quantity of spices in the ship's hold and liberated a few of the yellower ones. Also, various irritants rubbed in the eyes cause temporary discomfort but lasting external effect. I assure you I am doing myself no harm. But you have not eaten in days, and you're drinking far too heavily. The alcohol that disappears in my cabin ends up largely in the drains, with certain quantities used on breath and clothing. As for the food, I promise you that I shall allow Mrs. Hudson to feed me when she returns. When I step off the boat, Russell, every eye must know that here stands a beaten man, who cares not if he lives or dies. There would be no other reason for me to return openly. Very well. I just want your assurance that you will care for yourself in my absence. I will not have anything damage you, even your own hand. For the sake of the partnership, Russell? The smile in his voice reassured me more than his words. Precisely. I promise. I shall, if you wish, promise to wash out my socks at night too. That will not be necessary, Holmes. Mrs. Hudson will do that for you. We came home to London on a grey, heavy morning, both of us burnt by the sun and scorched by the fires of conflicts honest and contrived. I stood alone on the deck and watched the city approach, feeling the palpable unease of the captain and men as they worked behind me and below decks. Familiar forms stood on the dock as we approached. I could see Watson looking anxiously for Holmes and Inspector Lestrade standing next to him, equally curious at the detective's absence. Mycroft stood to one side, his face a closed book. They called to me as we pulled in, but I did not answer. When the gangway was let down, I seized my bags before one of the men could do so walked firmly across with my eyes down on the boards and pushed past the men standing on the dock to the obvious amazement of two of them. Watson held out his hand and Lestrade called, Miss Russell? Mary? Wait, Mary, what's wrong? I turned to them coldly, not looking at Mycroft. Yes? Where are you going? Is something wrong? Where is Holmes? A movement on the deck above caught my eye, and I looked up into Holmes's eyes. He looked dreadful. His grey irises stared out like holes in two blood-filled pools. His yellowed skin sagged over his bones, and he was poorly shaven, this normally fastidious individual. His tie was straight, but the collar of his shirt was slightly rumpled, and his jacket was unbuttoned. I squelched any urge to pity or uncertainty and summoned up every drop of the scorn I had spent the last days in distilling, filling my face, my stance, my mind with it, so that when I spoke, acid dripped from my words. There he is, gentlemen, the great Mr. Sherlock Holmes, saviour of nations, the mind of the century, God's gift to humanity, 
Gentlemen, I leave you to him. Our eyes met in a brief flash, and I saw in them both approval and apprehension, and a farewell. I turned on my heel and stalked away down the wharf. Watson must have started after me, because I heard Holmes's sharp, high-pitched and infuriating drawl stop my friend and uncle dead in his tracks. Let her go, Watson. She'll have none of us. She's off to make her mark on the world, can't you see? His voice sharpened further into a querulous cry that must have carried to the other side of the river. And God help any man who gets in her way. With these searing words on my coattails, I rounded the corner and set off to find a cab. It was the last I was to see of him for two months. Chapter 15 Separation Trial She is alone in the world, in the midst of an awakening spring. Back at Oxford, I threw myself furiously into my studies. I had missed nearly a month, and although the Oxford programme is not dependent on classes and attendance at lectures, one's absence is noted and strongly disapproved. My maths tutor was away, illness of some kind, and I was secretly grateful not to have that pressure. The woman who tutored Greek was also away, vanished into maternity over the Christmas holidays. By dint of working flat out for three weeks, I managed to redeem myself in the eyes of my remaining supervisors and felt that I had caught up to my own satisfaction as well. I changed that spring. For one thing, I no longer wore trousers and boots, but filled my wardrobe with expensive, austere skirts and dresses. I had, as I feared, alienated Ronnie Beaconsfield and lacked the energy to regain her friendship, but instead made an effort to make contact with the other girls in my year. I found I enjoyed it, although after a few hours their talk made me impatient for my solitude. I took long walks through the streets, and the desolate winter hills around Oxford. I took to attending church, particularly evensong at the cathedral, just to sit and listen. Once I went to a concert with a quiet young man from my patristics lecture. The music was Mozart and well played, but halfway through, the shining genius and the pain of it made it impossible to breathe, and I left. The young man did not ask me again. My written work changed, too. It became even more precise, less tolerant of other softer viewpoints, more ruthlessly logical. Brilliant and hard, like a diamond, was a remark from one reader, not altogether approving. I drove myself. I ate less, worked invariably into the early hours of morning, drank brandy now to help me sleep. I laughed when a librarian at the Bodleian suggested, only half-joking, that I might move into the stacks. But my laughter was a polite, brittle noise. I became, in other words, more like Holmes than the man himself. Brilliant, driven to a point of obsession, careless of myself, mindless of others, but without the passion and the deep-down inbred love for the good in humanity that was the basis of his entire career. He loved the humanity that could not understand or fully accept him. I, in the midst of the same human race, became a thinking machine. Holmes himself, on his farm in the South Downs, was retreating from the world into softness and bewilderment. Mrs. Hudson cut short her expedition to the Antipodes and returned home in late February. Her first letter to me was brief and shocked at the state she had found Holmes in. Subsequent letters neither accused nor begged, but pained me even more deeply when she simply stated that Holmes had not been out of bed one day, or that he was talking about selling his hives. Lestrade had set guards on the cottage at all times. He had tried to do the same for me, but I had baited him and eluded them, and finally he withdrew. I did not believe any of Lestrade's men could guard me better than I could myself, 
and as time went on, I was more surely convinced that the rules of the game had indeed been changed, and that I was not yet in danger. Besides, I found their constant presence unbearable. Watson wrote too, long, tentative letters, mostly about Holmes's health and mind. He came to see me once in Oxford. I took him for a long walk so I might not have to sit and face him, and the cold and my coolness sent him limping away with his bodyguard. It was a long, bitter winter after the warmth of Palestine. I read my Hebrew Bible, and I thought about Holofernes and the road to Jerusalem. In early March, I received a telegram from Holmes, his preferred method of communication. It said simply, Are you coming down between terms, query, Holmes? I read it openly at Mr. Thomas's busy front desk, and allowed a short twist of irritation to show on my face before I turned to go upstairs. The next day I sent him a return question. Should I? Query. Russell. The following day his response lay in my pigeonhole. Please do. Mrs. Hudson would also be glad. Holmes. Mine in return sent two days later confirmed that I would come. The next free day I went to London to see the executors of my parents' will, to lay before them the proposal that I be given sufficient advance from my inheritance, now less than two years away, to purchase a motor car. The partner who handled my parents' estate hemmed and hawed and made several private telephone calls, and to no great surprise of mine, he approved. I went down the next day to the Morris Oxford garage and paid for it, as well as arranging lessons. I was soon mobile. It was at this time, two weeks before the end of term, that I first became aware that I was being watched. I was highly preoccupied and often read a book while walking, so it is possible that they had been present before and I hadn't noticed them. The first time I saw the man... I was outside my lodgings and realised suddenly that I had forgotten a book. I doubled back quickly to get it and out of the corner of my eye noticed a man stoop down suddenly to tie his shoe. It wasn't until I had my key in the door that it hit me. He had been wearing laceless shoes. After that I was more attentive and found that a woman and another man alternated with the first. All were reasonably good at disguises, particularly the woman, and I should certainly not have been able to pick out the nun with no scuffs on her toes, or the man walking the bulldog as being the same person, had I not spent time under Holmes's tutelage. I had only one problem. If I had truly cut myself off from Holmes, I would not hide my annoyance at being spied on. However, I hesitated to bring the thing into the open before consulting him. This was the first time anyone had come sniffing around the bait at my end, and I was loath to frighten them off. Would the adversary believe that I was not seeing them? They were far from obvious, but still. I decided to continue as before, and became even more absent-minded until one day, as I had my Greek testament in front of my nose, I walked into a light post on the high street. I found myself sitting stupefied on the ground, while people exclaimed over the blood on my face, and a young woman held out my shattered spectacles. I came home from the surgery with a large plaster on my forehead, and I had to wear my spare spectacles for two days while the others were repaired. As I would probably not have recognised Mycroft Holmes himself standing in front of me with the old ones on, it settled temporarily the problem of whether or not I ought to notice my followers. The doctor who stitched me up suggested mildly that I keep my mind off aorist passive verbs while I was walking, and I had to agree. As an actress, I was a good changeling. When my new glasses came, I found my tail still behind me. I decided that I would drive to Sussex rather than take the train, and made prior 
public arrangements with the garage around the corner where I kept my new car, telling them that I would be leaving the next morning for my trip home. I wanted to be certain that I was followed, for I was on their mistress's trail every bit as much as they were on mine. They used five cars on the journey, which proved the money behind them. I wrote down the numbers from their plates when I could read them, which was in three cases, and noted carefully the cars and all their drivers. I doubt that the doctor would have considered the exercise less distracting than Aeris passives, but I avoided all accidents, and do not think I was the cause of anyone else's. When I took lunch in a pub before reaching Guildford, the young couple kissing in the front of the roadster pulled out of the parking area three cars behind me. When I stopped for tea on the road to Eastbourne, the old man, who had replaced the couple twenty miles earlier, drove past, but the woman in the old Morris, who was walking a familiar bulldog behind the inn, was soon behind me on the road. Her lights drove on past, only when I turned into my own road a few miles from Eastbourne. I breathed a sigh of relief that they hadn't lost me. I wanted them here, to witness my innocent behaviour and report it to their boss. My aunt was... well, she was herself. In the morning I saw that the farm was looking well, thanks to Patrick. He accompanied me on a tour. We greeted the cows, discussed the state of the barn's roof, examined the new foal that his huge plough mare, Vicky, had recently borne, and touched upon the possibility of investing in a tractor, which other farms in the area had turned to. I hung over the stable door and watched the beautiful dun colt with his stubby black tail flapping furiously, nuzzling at his mother in the warm, straw-strewn barn, and knew that I was seeing the end of an era. I said as much to Patrick, but he only grunted, as if to say that he was not about to get sentimental about a horse. He didn't fool me. It was the first time in well over a month that I'd worn trousers and waterproof boots, and they felt good. I invited Patrick up to the house for tea, but he, having no great love for my aunt, suggested his own little house instead. The tea was hot, strong and sweet, necessary for a cold spring morning. We talked about bills and building, and then suddenly he said, There were some men in the village asking about you. Not much went unnoticed in a village. These were obviously city people we were dealing with, but then I had assumed that. Yes? When was that? Three. Four weeks ago. What did they ask? Just about you. Where you was from, that kind of thing. And about Mr. Holmes. Wanting to know if you were seeing much of him. They asked Tilly down the inn, you know. He and Tilly have been seeing each other for some time now, I noted. She didn't realise they was asking till later, though. Because it was just a conversation, you see wasn't until she found they'd asked the same questions down the post office that she put the two together like. Interesting. Thanks for telling me. None of my business. But why aren't you seeing him anymore? Seems to have hit him bad. I looked at his honest face and told him what would have been the truth had I been telling the truth. You know that racehorse of Tom Warner's that he's so proud of? Wants to start a stud farm with. Yes, it's a fine runner. Would you hitch it up with Vicky to pull a plough? It was such a patently foolish question that he looked at me for a minute before answering. You're saying that Mr. Holmes wants you to be a plough horse? And that right now anyway, I need to run. Nothing wrong with a plough horse. It's just that if you force a racehorse to work along with a plough horse, they'll both get upset and kick apart the traces. That's what happened with Holmes and me. He's a good man. He came and took out a swarm from under Tilly's eaves last year. Didn't fuss. Not fussing was Patrick's highest accolade. 
See if you can hold yourself in long enough to see him. I think he'd like it. His gardener tells me he's ailing. Yes, I will see him. This afternoon, in fact. He mistook the hint of excitement in my voice for nervousness and reached over to pat my soft scholar's hand with his big calloused one. Don't you worry. Just remind yourself that you're not yoked to him and you'll be fine. I'll do that, Patrick, and thank you. I had arranged to be at Holmes's cottage at four o'clock, knowing that tea was Mrs Hudson's favourite meal to produce. There was a farm cart overturned on the road, which made me somewhat late. But at a quarter past four, I pulled the car into his gravel drive and shut off the motor. The sound of Holmes's violin came to my ears. The violin is, by its very nature, one of the most melancholy of instruments when played alone. Played as Holmes was doing, a slow and tuneless meditation. It was positively heart-wrenching. I slammed the car door noisily to interrupt and retrieved the basket of cheeses and fruits I had brought from Oxford. When I straightened up, the door of the cottage was open and Holmes was leaning against the door jamb, no expression on his face. Hello, Russell. Hello, Holmes. I walked up the path, trying to discern what was behind those hooded grey eyes and failing. I stood below him on the doorstep and held out the basket. I brought you and Mrs Hudson a few things from Oxford. That was nice of you, Russell, he said politely, voice and eyes saying nothing. He stepped back into the room to let me pass. Please come in. I took the basket through into the kitchen and somehow survived Mrs Hudson's welcome without breaking down into tears. I allowed myself to embrace her, hard, and let my lip quiver slightly to let her know that I was still Mary Russell, and then became polite again. She laid out vast quantities of food for us and talked on and on about the ship and the Suez Canal and Bombay and her son's family while I filled my plate with morsels I did not want. "'How did you hurt your head, Mary?' she finally asked me. I decided to make a joke out of it. The absent-minded undergraduate walking smack into the light post. But it didn't really succeed as humour. Mrs Hudson smiled uncomfortably and said she was glad the glass hadn't hurt my eye and Holmes watched me as if I were a specimen under his microscope. She excused herself and left us alone. Holmes and I drank our tea and pushed the food around on our plates. I told him what I had been doing that term, and he asked a few questions. Silence crept heavily in. I desperately asked him what he had been working on, and he described an experiment going on in his laboratory. I asked some questions to keep the flow of words going and he answered without much interest. Finally he put his cup down and gestured vaguely in the direction of his laboratory. Do you want to see it? Yes, certainly, if you want to show it to me. Anything was better than sitting here crumbling a cheese scone into a pile of greasy bits. We stood up and went into his windowless laboratory and he closed the door behind us. I saw immediately that there was no ongoing experiment, and when I turned to question him, he was standing against the door, his hands deep in his pockets. Hello, Russell, he said for the second time. Only now he was there in his face, and his eyes looked out at me, and I couldn't bear it. I turned my back on him, my hands two fists, my eyes shut. I could not see him now, talk to him, and still keep up the act. After a moment, two soft taps came on the door, and I smiled in sheer relief. He understood. He pushed a tall lab stool up behind me, and I sat on it, my back to him, eyes still closed. We have perhaps five minutes without it looking odd, he said. 
You're watched, I take it. Every move, even in the sitting room. They've made some arrangement with the neighbours, telescopes in the trees. They may even be able to read lips. Will tells me that rumour in town says they have a deaf person there. Patrick says they were asking about me and you. They are city people and don't know that you can't hide anything in the country. Yes, and they are sure of themselves. I assume you are being watched. I only saw them two weeks ago. Two men and a woman. Very good, too. Five cars followed me down here. The lady has money. We knew that. His eyes studied my back. Are you all right, Russell? You've lost half a stone since January. And you aren't sleeping. Only six pounds, not seven. And I sleep as you do. I'm busy. My voice dropped to a whisper. Holmes, I wish this were over. I felt him behind me and stood up abruptly. No, don't come near me. I couldn't bear it. And I don't think I can do this trip again. I'm fine when I'm in Oxford. But don't ask me to come down again until the end, please. Silence radiated off the man like heat waves, and the low, hoarse voice that came from him was a thing I had never heard before. Yes, he said. Yes, I understand. He stopped, cleared his throat, and I heard him take a deliberate long breath before he spoke again in his customary incisive tones. You are quite correct, Russell. There is nothing to be gained by it and much to lose. To business, then. I had copies of the photographs made for you. I gave the Roman numeral series to Mycroft, but neither of us can make any sense of it. I know it's there. Perhaps you can dig it out. It's that packet on the bench in front of you. I took the oversized brown envelope and put it in an inner pocket. We must go back out now, Russell. And in about ten minutes we will begin again. And you will leave angrily before Mrs. Hudson can offer you any supper. Yes? Yes, Holmes. Goodbye. He went back out into the sitting room, and I joined him a few minutes later. Within twenty minutes the sarcastic remarks were beginning to escalate, and shortly after six o'clock I slammed out of his cottage door without saying goodbye to Mrs. Hudson and sped off down the lane. Two miles away I stopped the car and rested my forehead on the wheel for some time. It was all too real. Chapter 16 The Daughter of the Voice Is it so certain, then, that the new generation will do something you have not done? The dreary weeks dragged on. My watchers remained discreet and I absent-minded. Trinity term began and I was almost too busy to remember that my isolation was an act. Almost. Often at night I would start awake from bed or chair, thinking I had heard two soft taps at the door. But there was never anything. I moved in a woolly cocoon of words and numbers and chemical symbols and spent my every spare minute in the Bodleian. Oddly, the dream did not come. Spring arrived, hesitant at first, and then in a rush, heady, rich, long days that pushed the nighttime back into ever smaller intervals. The first spring in five, free from the rumour of guns across the channel a spring anxious to make up for the cold winter, life bursting out from four years of death. All of England raised her face to the sun, or nearly all. I was aware of the spring peripherally, aware that no one in the university save myself and a number of shell-shocked ex-soldiers was doing any work. And even I submitted to a picnic on Boar's Hill, 
and another day allowed myself to be dragged off for a punting expedition up river to Port Meadow. For the most part, though, I ignored the blandishments of my former friends and current neighbours and kept my head down to work. That was the pattern for most of May, and it was the case on the day, nearly at May's end, when the tight, snarled threads of the case began to come loose in my hands. Upon my return from Sussex, I was faced with the problem of where to put the envelope Holmes had given me. I could no longer depend on the security of my rooms, and preferred not to carry it about on my person at every moment. In the end, I decided that the safest place to hide it was behind one of the more obscure volumes around the corner from the desk where I habitually worked in the Bodleian. It was a risk, but short of buying a safe or visiting the bank vaults with suspicious regularity, either of which would have alerted our enemy that I was up to something, it was the safest risk I could come up with. After all, the general public was not allowed inside the library, so my watchers usually waited long hours outside, and both the hiding place and my work table were in dim corners, where it was easy to see people approaching. Over the weeks, I retrieved it any number of times to study the mysterious series of Roman numerals. Like Holmes, I knew our opponent well enough to be positive that this was a message, and like Holmes and his brother both, I could find no key to unlock it. However, the mind has an amazing ability to continue worrying away at a problem all on its own, so that when the Eureka comes, it is as mysterious as if it were God speaking. The words given voice inside the mind are not always clear, however. They can be gentle and elliptical, what the prophets called the Bart Cole, the daughter of the voice of God, she who speaks in whispers and half-seen images. Holmes had cultivated the ability to still the noise of the mind by smoking his pipe or playing non-tunes on the violin. He once compared this mental state with the sort of passive seeing that enables the eye, in a dim light or at a great distance, to grasp details with greater clarity by focusing slightly to one side of the object of interest. When active, strained vision only obscures and frustrates. Looking away often permits the eye to see and interpret the shapes of what it sees. Thus does inattention allow the mind to register the still, small whisper of the daughter of the voice. I had been working hard. I had spent a sleepless night and rose to birdsong. I had attended a lecture, finished an essay, and twice taken out the packet of photographs Holmes had given me. I held each one by its increasingly worn edges, studying the mute series of numerals until they were burnt into my brain. Every wisp of horsehair that tufted from the crossed slashes, every straight edge of the twenty-five recalcitrant black Roman numerals, I even turned the photographs upside down for twenty minutes in hopes of stirring some reaction, but there was nothing. All that happened was that I became increasingly irritable at having to cover them with some innocent papers every time someone walked by my work table. In the late afternoon, the traffic past my table picked up, and after having slipped the photographs away seven times in less than an hour, my temper snapped. I had no idea if those accursed slashes meant anything or not, and here I was wasting precious hours on a problem that quite possibly existed only in my mind. I shoved the photos back in their envelope and into their hidey-hole and stalked out of the library in a foul mood. I did not even care what my watchers would think. I was so disgusted with myself. Let them wonder. Maybe there is no goddamned enemy, I thought blackly. Maybe Holmes really has gone mad, and it's all one of his little tricks. Another examination. By the time I reached my rooms, I had calmed down somewhat, but the look of my desk waiting reproachfully in the corner was more than I could bear. I heard my neighbour moving around in her room next door. 
I went out into the corridor. Hello, Dot, I called. She appeared at her door. Oh, hello, Mary. Cup of tea? Oh, no, thanks. Are you doing anything urgent tonight? I'm going to hell with Dante, but I'd be glad of an excuse to put it off. What's up? I'm so sick of it. I can't face another book, and I thought, You? Sick of books? Her face would not have registered more disbelief if I had sprouted wings. I laughed. Yes, even Mary Russell gets fed up occasionally. I thought I'd have dinner at the Trout and go listen to a harpsichord recital a fellow in one of my lectures is giving. Interested? When do we leave? Half an hour all right with you. Forty-five minutes would be better. Right, I'll call for a cab. We had a pleasant dinner. Dorothy found a friend to flirt with, and we went to the recital. It was an informal affair, mostly bark, which has the beauty and cadence of a well-balanced mathematical formula, particularly when played on the harpsichord. The symmetry and nobility of the master's music, together with a glass of the champagne served afterwards, calmed my nerves, and I found myself in bed before midnight, a rare occurrence in the past few months. It was, I think, about three in the morning, when I jerked up in my bed, my pulse thudding thickly in my ears, my breath coming as fast as if I had sprinted upstairs. I had been dreaming. Not the dream, but a confusing mixture of things real and imagined. A shadowy face had leered at me from the bookshelf in the corner, half hidden by blonde hair, and held out a clay pipe in a twisted hand. You know nothing. The figure cackled in a voice both male and female, and laughed horribly. His, her, gnarled fist tightened over the pipe, which I knew to be one of Holmes's, and then opened. Shards bounced slowly about the floor. I stared despairingly at the shattered pipe, and knelt down to retrieve the pieces, in hopes of gluing it together again. Some of the larger bits had rolled underneath the bookshelf, and I had to lie down to reach them. As I felt around, my hand was suddenly seized, and I shot upright in terror with a fading image of the bookshelf in my mind's eye. It had been a section of history, the titles all on Henry the Eighth. I groped for a light and my spectacles, and lay back until my cold sweat dried, and my heart no longer pounded in my chest. I knew that I could never get back to sleep after that, so I reached for my dressing gown and went to make myself a cup of tea. In a few minutes I was sitting, inhaling the comforting steam and thinking about the nightmare. It was very rare for me to be aware of dreams, other than the dream, and I could not remember having another nightmare since my family had died. What was the purpose behind this one? Some of its elements were obvious, but some were not. Why, for example, was the hidden blonde both male and female, when I invariably thought of my adversary as female? The smashed pipe was an easily understood image of my intense, nearing, frantic anxiety about homes, and bookshelves were such a part of my life that I could hardly imagine any part of me, even a dream, omitting them. But why were the books on history? I held no great passion for recent history, and due to my erratic schooling, English history was a relative stranger. What was King Henry doing in front of my eyes? That obscene, gout-ridden old man, with his numerous wives, all of them sacrificed to his desire for sons, as if it were their fault, and not that of his own syphilitic self. What would Freud make of that dream, I wondered, with Holmes falling beneath the misogynist king to the echoes of a man-woman's laughter? It was the sort of thing that would have made Dr. Leah Ginsburg lean forward in her chair with a Germanic ya, yeah, and then... I sighed into the silent room and reached for my books. If I had to be up at three o'clock in the morning, I might as well make some use of it. 
Henry the Eighth or no. I settled myself to work, but all morning the dream kept intruding, and I would find myself staring blankly at the wall in front of me, seeing the spines of those books. Henry the Eighth. What did that mean? I worked on, and in the afternoon I went out to take coffee in the covered market before an afternoon lecture, and I ended up ordering a large meal I had not known I wanted, until I had walked into the tantalizing smell of frying bacon, two meals actually, and pudding, more food than I had taken at one sitting at any time since Mrs. Hudson had been feeding me. Somewhat bloated, I left the market stalls and walked up Turl Street for the afternoon lecture. Only to find my steps slowing as I approached the broad. I stopped. Henry the Eighth. When in ignorance, consult a library. With few qualms, I abandoned the inquiry into Second Dynasty burial texts, and turned right instead of left. The familiar loitering and over-aged undergraduate behind me emerged from a shop entrance and followed me up Broad Street and past the Sheldonian. But not through the doors of the library. I called up several books on the period, but they bore no resemblance to my dream image, and leafing slowly through them caused no bells to go off in my mind. Knowing it was hopeless, I retrieved the photographs, laid them out on the desk in front of me, and it was then that the voice spoke to me, and I knew. Holmes and I had discussed the possibility that the series was based on a number-letter substitution code, in which, for example, one might be read as A, two as B, and three one two translates as cab. Extreme complexity, basing the substitution on a key text primarily, is commonly used to make the translation from number to letter difficult. A long message in such a code can be broken by a bit of fiddling. But for short phrases, one must discover the key. If the key is something external, such as the words on a page of a book, decoding a brief message such as the one we were faced with may prove virtually impossible. In this case, the numerals used were not our Arabic ones, but Roman ones, and as they had not been spaced or had their divisions marked. It was sheer guesswork to know whether there were twenty-five separate numbers or only seven, or some total in between. That is where Holmes and I had left off, as we could make no sense in the number-letter result we had extracted. I had to make a few basic assumptions in looking at the problem. First of all, I had to assume that she had left it there for us to see and eventually understand. That it was not just a means of maddening us with tantalizing clues that led nowhere. Second, I had to believe that the key to it lay somewhere in front of me, waiting to be seen. Third, I assumed that once the key was found, it would unlock the puzzle fairly quickly. If it did not, I would undoubtedly conclude that this was not the correct key, and lay it down again. To give an example. It would call for a bone-headed sort of persistence to unravel the Roman numeral series X V I I I X I I I I X X V through all its possible Arabic equivalents into the numbers eighteen, thirteen, one, twenty-five, and then into R M A Y, and then finally to unscramble it to Mary, unless the person already knew what she was looking at. No. The key would not give too much difficulty once it was inserted into the lock. Of that I was certain. If I was right, the key had been found by the still small daughter of a voice, and laid into my dream for me to find. Henry the Eighth meant nothing to me, but V I I I or base eight meant a great deal. If human beings had been born with three fingers instead of four opposing their thumbs, we would count by units of eight instead of tens. A one plus a zero would mean eight. One one would be how we wrote nine. 
and 2 o would be the same as a base 10 16. I wrote it out on a piece of paper, the first 26 numbers in base 8 with the alphabet underneath. I was left with the problem of dividing up the 25 Roman numerals into numbers whose letter equivalent said something. Although I knew them by heart now, backwards and forwards, I wrote them out too as a visual aid. 25 numerals, 1s, 5s and 10s. Taken at its most straightforward, these yielded a series of H's, E's and A's, which would be meaningless. My job was to divide that string up so that the letters made sense. I began with the first ten numerals. X, V, X, V, I, I, X, X, I, I. That last I might be attached to the following X to make nine, but I should keep that possibility in mind. X, V, X, V, I, or ten, five, ten, five, one, yielded H-E-H-E-A, which, unless she wanted to show her derisive laughter, made no sense. Taking the first XV as 15 gave me M-H-E-A. XVXVII equals 10, 5, 17. Gave H-E-O, which was better than the other. Higher numbers gave the greatest variation of the alphabet. I tried using the highest possible numbers I could get from the 25 digits, which divided into 15, 17, 22, 12, 22, 24, 31. In base 10, this had read O-Q-V-L-V-X. The 31 was a problem because there are only 26 letters. However, in base 8, that yielded M-O-R-J-R-T-Y. It took me a moment to realize what I was seeing. My pencil reached out by itself and slowly crossed out the figure 12, substituting 11, 1. And there it was. Moriarty. Moriarty could not have done this. The professor of mathematics turned criminal mastermind had died at the hands of Sherlock Holmes, hurled over a huge falls in Switzerland nearly thirty years before. Why, then, was his name here? Was our foe telling us that the purpose behind our persecution was revenge for his death, after nearly three decades? Or was there meant to be a parallel between this case and that of Moriarty and Holmes? I do not know how long I sat there in the Bodleian while the light faded outside. But eventually the little daughter of a voice whispered for one last time. And I heard myself talking to Holmes in my room on the night it all began. My maths tutor and I came across some mathematical exercises developed by an old acquaintance of yours while we were working with problems in base 8 theory. And the whispery voice of Holmes in my ears Professor Moriarty? My maths tutor? She was not the owner of the blonde hairs we had found in the cab. Her hair was dark and tinged with grey. However, she had laid Professor Moriarty's base eight exercises before me on the very day the bomb appeared at my door, and I knew now, three days later, had slashed that string of ciphers with great precision into the seats of our cab. My maths tutor, Patricia Donlevy, who had left because of an unexplained illness beginning that same week. My maths tutor, a strong woman, a mind of great subtlety, one of the teachers I had found to learn from, who had shaped me, whose approval I cherished, with whom I had talked about my life and about Holmes. Another Moriarty, Holmes had speculated, and she herself had just confirmed it. I pushed the implications from me. My maths tutor? 
I looked up blankly to see someone standing beside my desk, a desk openly strewn with photographs, calculations, and the translation. It was one of the old library clerks, looking amused. He had the attitude of someone who has waited to be noticed. Sorry, Miss Russell. It's time to close up. Already? Heavens, Mr. Douglas, I had no idea. I'll be with you in a minute. No rush, Miss. I have some tidying to do, but I wanted to let you know before you took root in here. I'll let you out when you come down. As I began hastily to insert the pages back into their envelope, a very unpleasant thought came to me. How many other people had glanced onto the desk during the evening? I knew I had been careful to hide the photographs at first, but at what point had I become so engrossed in the mathematical detective work that I had simply not seen who came past? I seemed to remember two first-year men who had been searching for a book, and an old priest who coughed and blew his nose loudly. But who else? I hope no one. Mr. Douglas let me out with a cheery, Night now, and locked the door behind me. The dark courtyard was deserted but for the statue of Thomas Bodley, and I walked quickly through the entrance arch to the broad, which conversely seemed crowded and well-lit and safe. I walked back to my lodgings deep in thought. What to do next? Telephone Holmes and hope no one was listening in? Send him a coded telegram? I doubted I could devise one quickly. A message Holmes could read and Patricia Don Levy could not. If I went to him, could I do so without alerting my watchers? A sudden movement on my part could endanger Holmes. And where was Miss Don Levy? How could I find her? And how could we spring a trap on her now? In the midst of all these whirling thoughts, I became aware of some other idea niggling gently at the back of my mind. I stopped dead and tried to encourage it to show itself. What was troubling me? Busy street? No, not even so crowded now. The idea of the telephone? No, wait, back up. Not crowded. The watchers? Where is my watcher? and I saw then that I had not been followed since I left the Bodleian, and I knew immediately what it meant that they had been pulled off me. I clapped my hat to my head and ran. Mr. Thomas looked up startled at the crashing entrance of a breathless undergraduate into his lodge. Mr. Thomas, get Holmes on the telephone. I have to talk with him. It's an emergency. I was grateful that the old man did not pretend he didn't know the name of his unacknowledged employer merely saw my face and reached for the telephone. I stood tautly, tapping my fingers on the counter, wanting to scream at the slowness of the thing. Connections were made, exchanges consulted, and then Mr. Thomas's face became still. I see, he said, and thank you. He hung up and looked at me. The telephone line seems to be down on that side of Eastbourne, he said. Some kind of accident on the road, apparently. Can I do anything, miss? Yes. You can go around the corner and tell the garage to get my motor out. I'll be there in a few minutes. With surprising agility, Mr. Thomas ducked out the door, leaving his post unattended, and I pounded off up the stairs. I had the key in my hand before I cleared the last stair, reached for the keyhole, and stopped. There, in the middle of the shiny brass knob, was a black, greasy smudge. Holmes? I whispered. Holmes? And flung open the door. Chapter 17 Forces Joined The enterprise is hopeful, but full of hardship and danger. It would seem to have been conceived by some sovereign intelligence that was able to divine most of our desires. 
It's a good thing there wasn't another bomb here, Russell. There wouldn't be much left of you. It was the old priest from the library sitting in my chair and peering at me with disapproval over his spectacles. Oh, God, Holmes, it is good to see you. To this day he swears that I thrust his head between my breasts, but I am quite certain that he was on his feet by the time I reached him. I was reassured that his musculature had not suffered during his weeks of confinement and enforced sloth, and in fact felt distinctly bruised about the ribcage from the force of his arms. He, of course, denies this. Holmes! Holmes, we can talk again. It's over. I know who she is, but I thought she had you. My watch has disappeared, and your telephone line is out, and I was coming up here to get the revolver and drive down to Sussex, but you're here and... Fortunately, Holmes interrupted this drivel. Very well, Russell. I am flattered that you seem relieved to see me alive, but could you be a bit clearer, please, particularly concerning the telephone line and the watchers? He reached up to reattach his beard, and I stooped to pick up an eyebrow from the floor and absently handed it to him. I've been working in Bodley this afternoon. Oh, for God's sake, Russell, don't be completely daft. Or has my absence softened your brain? Oh, of course, you were there. Why didn't you make yourself known then? And have a scene like this in the midst of those hallowed halls? I thought you might wish to work there again in the future, so I came here to wait for you. I could also see you were on the edge of something and didn't want to risk knocking it out of your head. I did blow my nose loudly in your ear, if you remember, but when that failed to get your attention, I took the hint and left. What did you find? I could see that you were working on the Roman numerals theory, but without peering too closely, I couldn't see where your thoughts were taking you. Yes, Holmes. It was a code. Roman numerals in a base 8, not base 10. It's spelt Moriarty. And do you know who had me working on base 8 three days before the bombs were set? I do remember. Yes, your maths tutor. But how does... Yes. And she even told me of Moriarty's exercises, though not directly, of course, just mentioned offhand that she had seen some problems in a book and... Oh, I see now. Yes, of course. Of course what? Your maths tutor is a woman. I might have known. Didn't you know? I thought I told you. But she's not blonde, you see, so... And where is she now? Kindly quit blithering, Russell. I should greatly enjoy catching this woman if she is so kind as to walk into our trap, so I shouldn't have to spend the rest of my life dodging bombs and pretending to detest the very mention of your name. Oh, yes, but she is. I mean, she withdrew my watches today while I was in the library. She may have guessed what I was doing, or she may have just decided to go ahead. But the telephone lines to the village are down, so I thought... Right you are, Russell, and that means we must fly. Can you put on some more sensible clothing? There may be rough work ahead of us. I plunged into the next room and into my young man's mufti in two minutes flat, and in another thirty seconds had my boots on and the gun and a handful of bullets in my pocket. The two of us created quite a sensation clattering down the stairs. The hypochondriac down the hall had just come out of the bathroom when we came running towards her. She screamed and clutched her dressing gown to her chest as we flew past. Men? Two men in the hall? Oh, for God's sake, Di, it's me, I shouted ungrammatically. She leant over the stairwell with several others to watch our descent. Mary? But who's that with you? An old friend of the family. But it's a man. So I noticed. But men aren't allowed in here. Their protests faded above us. Russell, I must use Mr. Thomas's telephone. Ah, here he is. Pardon me, Thomas. I beg your pardon, Reverend Sir. May I help you? Miss Russell, who is this? Please, sir, what do you want? Sir, the telephone is not for public use, sir. 
Mr. Thomas, is my car ready? I interrupted while Holmes awaited connection. What? Ah, yes, miss. They said they would bring it out for you. Miss, who is this gentleman? A friend of the family, Mr. Thomas. Dear me, I hear Diane at the top of the stairs. Do you think you should perhaps see what she wants? You know how highly strung she is. No, Mr. Thomas, you go help her. I'll show this friend of mine out. Yes, friend of the family, very old. Yes, goodbye, Mr. Thomas. I'll not be back in tonight. Or tomorrow night, shouted Holmes. Come, Russell. The car was warmed up and running at the curb, and the garage man quickly got out when he saw us coming, then paused with his hand on the door. Is that you, Miss Russell? Yes, Hugh. Thanks a million. Bye. He winced as I squealed the tyres. But after all, it wasn't his motor car. Holmes did more than wince before we were out of Oxford. But I didn't hit anybody and only brushed the farm cart slightly. It wasn't his automobile either. And what do men know about driving? When I had settled the Morris down to a slow blur on the black and narrow road out of Oxford, I turned to Holmes. What are you doing here, anyway? I say, Russell, do you think, that is, is this the proper speed for this particular road and these, watch the cow, these particular conditions? Well, I could go a bit faster if you like, Holmes. I suppose the car would take it. No, that is not what I had in mind. Then what? Oh, of course you want an alternate route. You're right as usual, Holmes. Reach behind you and get the maps. They're in that black pouch there. There's a hand torch in the pocket. Holmes, your eyebrow's fallen off again. I'm not surprised, he muttered and peeled off the rest of the disguise. You make a fine priest, Holmes, very distinguished. Now, those maps start with Oxford and work their way down to Eastbourne. There's a point in a few miles where we can get off to the left. It's marked as a farm track. Do you see it? Holmes claims that night's ride took ten years from his life, but I found it quite exhilarating to be rocketing along unlighted country lanes at high speeds with a man I hadn't been able to properly speak with openly for so many months. He didn't seem to find many topics of conversation during those hours, though, so I had to fill in. Once... When we slipped by inches through a gap between a hay wagon and a stone wall, losing considerable paint to the latter, Holmes was really quite uncharacteristically silent. After some minutes, I asked him if he was feeling well. Russell, if you decide to take up Grand Prix racing, do ask Watson to do your navigating. This is just his métier. Why, Holmes, do you have doubts about my driving? No, Russell, I freely admit that when it comes to your driving abilities, I have no doubts whatsoever. The doubts I have are concerned with the other end of our journey. The question of our arrival, for one thing. And what we shall find when we get there? That too. But it is perhaps not of such immediate concern. Russell, did you see that tree back there? Yes, a fine old oak, wasn't it? Well, I hope it still is, he muttered. I laughed merrily. He winced. We succeeded in working our way across all the major arteries coming from London on our cross-country flight. Finally, we shook them off and straightened out for the last clear run at home. I glanced at Holmes in the pale moonlight. Are you going to tell me how you came to be in Oxford and what your plans are for the next few hours? Russell, I really think you ought to slow this machine down. We cannot know when we will come across our opponent's minions and we do not wish to attract their attention. They believe you are in Oxford and I am in bed. I allowed the speedometer to show a more sedate speed, which seemed to satisfy him. Hedgerows and farm gates flew past in our headlamps, but it was still too early for the farmers themselves. I came to Oxford by train commonplace method of transport considerably more comfortable than your racing car. Holmes, it's only a Morris. After tonight, I doubt the factory would recognise it. At any rate, 
I regret to inform you that your friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, has taken a definite turn for the worse. It seems that last week he foolishly allowed himself to take a chill and was soon in bed with pneumonia. He refused to go into hospital. Nurses were in attendance around the clock. The doctor came regularly and looked grim when he left. Russell, have you any idea how difficult it is to find a specialist who can both lie and act? Thank God for Mycroft's connections. How have you kept Watson away? He did come to see me once last week. It took me two hours to apply the makeup to convince him, and even then I had to refuse to let him examine me. If he had come bouncing out of my cottage like a cat hiding the feathers, can you imagine what that would have done with the trap? The man never could prevaricate. Mycroft had to convince him that if anything were to happen to my dear friend Watson, it truly would do me in. So he is back in hiding. Poor Uncle John. We shall have a lot of explaining to do when this is over. He has always been most forgiving. But to continue, I had thought that my grave illness might increase the pressure on the woman and force a move out of her. I was going to speak to you about it when you came down this week, as I knew you should when you got Mrs. Hudson's weekly letter tomorrow, or rather today. But he began to move faster than I had anticipated. So I came to Oxford to consult, only to find that you in turn were coming here. What happened to make you come? You know my hillside watchers? They've really become most careless. Glints of light from their glasses and lighting cigarettes in the dark. One of Mycroft's little gifts last month was a high-powered telescope. So I've spent a great deal of time behind my bedroom curtains watching the watchers. Their routine is quite predictable. Always the same people at the same times. Then suddenly yesterday, or rather the day before yesterday, Sunday evening it was, as I was watching them watch me, they all disappeared. A man whom I hadn't seen before came from the back side of the hill. They talked for a few minutes, and then off they went, leaving their equipment behind them. I hadn't dared hope for something like that, but given the opportunity I wasn't about to let it go by. I sent old Will up to take a look and bring back what he could find for me. He's retired. But in his day he was the best, and when he doesn't want to be seen, a hawk wouldn't find him. He came back two hours later, just after dark, with a fine sack of rubbish for me to pick over. Cheese rinds, an old boot heel, some biscuit wrappers, a wine bottle. I took it into the laboratory, and what did I find? Oxford cheese, Oxford mud on the old heel, and a wrapper around the biscuits from a shop in the Oxford-covered market. I smoked a couple of pipes and decided to spend the day in bed while catching the morning train. The doctor, by the way, gave a slightly more hopeful prognosis this afternoon. The night nurse has been dismissed, and the sound of my violin has been heard from behind the bedroom curtains on and off throughout the afternoon. You know, Russell, of all the miracles of modern technology, I have found the gramophone the most useful. Incidentally, he added, Mrs. Hudson is in on the charade now. You could hardly keep it up without her, I'd have thought. How is she doing at the game? She was absolutely delighted to join in and has emerged as a very competent actress, to my surprise. Women never cease to amaze me. I did not comment, not aloud. That explains it until now. What comes next? The signs all point to a rapidly approaching denouement. Would you not agree, Russell? Without a doubt. Furthermore, all my instincts tell me that she will want to meet me face to face. The fact that she has not lobbed an artillery shell into the cottage or poisoned my well is an open statement that it is not just my death that she wants. I have been dealing with the criminal mind for forty years now, and of this I am certain. 
She will arrange a meeting so as to gloat over my weakness and her victory. The only question is, will she come to me or have me brought to her? Not exactly the only question, Holmes. I should think even more important the question of our response. Do we meet or not? No, dear Russell, that is no question. I have no choice but to meet her. I am the bait, remember? We have simply to decide how best to position you, to give you the best opportunity to strike. I must admit, he mused softly, I am quite looking forward to meeting this particular adversary. I braked hard to avoid running over a badger and resumed. Holmes, if I didn't know better, I might think you were becoming quite infatuated with Patricia Donlevy. No, you needn't answer. I shall just have to remember that if I ever want to catch your attention, all I need do is threaten to blow you up. Russell, I should never have thought... Never mind, Holmes, never mind. Really, Holmes, you are a most exasperating partner at times. Would you please get on with it? We'll be at my farm in two minutes, and you still haven't told me your plan of campaign. Talk, Holmes. Oh, very well. My telephone call was to Mycroft, asking him to bring a few of his most discreet individuals into the area after dark tonight. Last night there were too many people coming around my cottage to allow your Miss Don Levy to make her move. But today my medical friend will announce that I am recovering and need peace and quiet. Mrs. Hudson will take herself to bed early, at her end of the cottage, and we shall lie in wait. I believe your manager, Patrick, is trustworthy? Completely. We can leave the car in the barn and walk to the cottage across the downs. I assume that's what you have in mind. You do know my methods, Russell. Ah, here we are. I drove through the gates and up to the doors of the old barn that lay apart next to the road. Holmes jumped out and opened the door for me. Once we had shifted a few hay bales, the vehicle fit in snugly between the stalls, and Vicky and her various family members peered at the odd black intruder with mild curiosity. I'll go tell Patrick it's here so he'll keep the door shut. Back in a few minutes. I let myself into Patrick's house and climbed the stairs to his room, whispering his name at regular intervals so that he wouldn't take me as a burglar. He was a sound sleeper, but I finally roused him. Patrick, for God's sake, man, the barns could burn and you'd sleep on. What? Barns? Fire? I'm coming. Who's that? Tilly? No, no, Patrick, no fire. Don't get up. It's I, Mary. Miss Mary? What's wrong? Let me get a light. No light, Patrick. Don't get up. I could see by moonlight that the top half of his body was unclothed and I had no wish to find out about the other. I just had to tell you that I've hidden my car in the lower barn. Don't let it be seen. It's very important that nobody knows I'm here, even my aunt. Will you do that, Patrick? Certainly. But where are you? Here. I'll be at Holmes's cottage. There's trouble, Miss Mary, isn't there? Can I help? If you can, I'll get a message to you. Just don't let anyone see my car. Go back to sleep now, Patrick. Sorry to wake you. Good luck, Miss. Thank you, Patrick. Holmes was waiting for me outside the house. We set off in silence across the dark downs, empty but for the foxes and owls. It was not the first time I had walked that way at night, though the setting moon lit the first couple of miles. I was concerned at first that his confinement might have lessened Holmes's normally iron constitution, but I needn't have worried. It was I who breathed heavily at the tops of hills from the hours spent in the library, not he. Sounds carry at night so our conversation was low and terse, dwindling to a few muttered words as the miles passed and his cottage neared. The moon had set, and it was the darkest time of night before the stars faded. We stood on the edge of the orchard that backed the cottage, and Holmes leant close to breathe words into my ear. We'll circle around 
and go in through the end door, then straight up to the laboratory. We can have a light in there. It won't be seen. Keep to the shadows, and remember there's a guard about somewhere. He felt my nod and slipped away. Five minutes later, the door clicked lightly to his key, and I stood inside the dark cottage, breathing in the mingled smells of pipe tobacco, toxic chemicals, and meat pies, the fragrance of home and happiness. Come, Russell, are you lost? His low voice came from above me. I pushed away the feelings of reunion and followed him up the worn steps and around the corner, not needing a light, until my hand touched the air of an open doorway and I stepped inside. The air moved as Holmes swung the door closed. Stay there until I make a light, Russell. I've moved some things about since you were here last. A match flared and illuminated his profile bent over an old lamp. I have a cloth to tack up over the door edges, he said, and adjusted the flame to give the greatest light, then turned to set it on a work table. My nose tells me that Mrs. Hudson produced meat pies yesterday, I said, shrugging off my coat and hanging it on the peg on the door. I'm glad she is convinced of your approaching recovery. I turned back to Holmes, and I saw his face. He was looking across the lamp to the dark corner, and whatever it was he saw there bathed his face in dread and despair and the finality of defeat. And he was utterly still, slightly bent from depositing the lamp on the table. I took two quick steps forward so I could see around the bookshelf. And there, dominating my vision, was the round, reflected end of a gun, moving to point directly at me. I looked at Holmes and saw then the first fear I had ever witnessed in his eyes. Good morning, Mr. Holmes, said a familiar voice. Miss Russell? Holmes straightened his long body slowly, looking terribly, utterly exhausted. And when he replied, his voice was as flat as death. Miss Don Levy. Chapter 18. Battle Royal. There being not room for many emotions in her narrow, barbarous, practical brain. What, Mr. Holmes? No bon mot? I perceive you have been in Afghanistan or New York. Well, not every utterance a gem, perhaps. And you, Miss Russell, no greeting for your tutrix? Not even an apology for the inadequacy of your final essay, which was not only sodden, but hurried as well. At the sound of her precise, slightly hoarse voice, I was overcome, pierced to the core of my being, her voice sweeping me into memories of her dim and opulent study, the coal fire, the tea she served me, the two occasions when she had given me a glass of rare dry sherry to accompany her rare dry words of praise. I had thought... I had thought I knew what her feelings towards me were, and I stood before her like a child whose beloved godmother has just stabbed her. You do look like a pair of donkeys, she said in irritation, and if her first words had left me stunned, her quick ill humour jolted me back into life, an automatic response learnt early by all of her students. When Miss Don Levy snaps, one gathered one's wits with alacrity. I had seen her reduce a strong man to tears. Sit down, Miss Russell. Mr. Holmes, while I have this gun pointed at Miss Russell, would you be so good as to switch on the electrical lights I see over our heads? Move very carefully. The gun is already cocked, and it takes very little pressure to set the trigger off. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. 
You look considerably further from death's door than I was led to believe. Now, if you would please bring that other chair and place it at the table to the left of Miss Russell. A bit further apart. Good. And the lamp. Extinguish it and place it on the shelf. Yes, there. Now, sit down. You will please leave your hands on top of the table at all times, both of you. Good. I sat at arm's length from Holmes and looked past the guns more at my mathematics tutor. She was sitting in the very corner of the room behind a rank of shelves so that the shadow cast by the shelves cut directly across her. The overhead glare illuminated her tweed and silk-covered legs from the knee down and occasionally the very end of the heavy military pistol. All else was dim, an occasional flash of teeth and eyes a dull glint from the gold chain and locket she wore at her throat. All else was shadow. Mr. Holmes, we meet at last. I have been looking forward to this meeting for quite some time. Twenty-five years or more, isn't it, Miss Dunleavy? Or do you prefer to be addressed by your father's name? Silence filled the laboratory, and I sat bewildered. Did Holmes know where the woman came from? Her father? Touché, Mr. Holmes. I take back my earlier criticism. You still do a nice line in Bon Mail. Perhaps you might explain to Miss Russell. It was her own name that Miss Donlevy signed on the seats of the four-wheeler, Russell. This is the daughter of Professor Moriarty. Surprise, surprise, Miss Russell. You did tell me what a very superior sort of mind your friend has. What a pity he was born trapped in a man's body. With a wrenching effort, I took control of my thoughts and sent them, useless as it might now seem, in the direction of the last plan that Holmes and I had laid. I swallowed and studied my hands on the tabletop. I cannot agree, Miss Donleby. I said. Mr. Holmes's mind and his body seem to me well suited to each other. Miss Russell, she said delightedly, sharp as always. I must admit I had forgotten how I always enjoyed your mind. And as you intimate, I had also forgotten that the two of you have become alienated. I must say I often wondered what you saw in him. I could have done a great deal with you had it not been for your irrational fondness for Mr. Holmes. I pointedly said nothing, just studied my hands. I did wonder why they weren't shaking. But now the fondness has turned, has it? She said in a voice that was soft and tinged with sadness. So very sad, when old friends part and become enemies. My heart leapt with hope, but I kept all expression from my face. If she believed this, we might yet get around her. It was difficult for me to tell, partly because I had to judge solely by her voice and also because my trust in my own perceptions had been badly shaken. But beyond this, she also seemed somehow foreign, her reactions exaggerated, fluctuating. I had little time to reflect on the question, because Holmes stirred at my side and spoke up, his voice flat. Kindly refrain from baiting the child, Miss Donleavy, and continue. I believe you have something you wish to say to me. The round metal circle on her knee began to shake slightly, and after a brief moment of terror I heard her laughter, and I felt ill. She had been playing with me. We might have fooled her for a time, but now our act was exposed, and even the small chance we'd had with deception was no longer ours. You are right, Mr. Holmes. I have not much time, and you have robbed me of a great deal of energy in the last few days. I have no great energy to spare, you understand. I am dying. Oh, yes, Miss Russell, my absence from the college was no sham. 
There is a crab with its claws in my belly and no way to remove it. I had originally planned to wait several years for this, Mr. Holmes, but I do not have the leisure now. Before much longer, I will not have the strength to deal with you. It must be now. Her voice echoed in the tiled laboratory and whispered away like a snake. Very well, Miss Donlevy. You have me at your mercy. Let us dismiss Miss Russell and get on with the issues between us. Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. Sorry, I cannot do that. She is a part of you now, and I cannot deal with you without including her. She stays. Her voice had gone cold. So cold it was hard for me to connect it with a person who had drunk tea with me and laughed in front of a fire. Cold and with danger uncoiling from its base. I shivered, and she saw it. Miss Russell is cold, and I imagine tired. We all are, my dear. But we have a while to go before the end. Come now, Mr. Holmes, don't keep your protégé here all day. I am sure you have a number of questions you would like to ask me. You may begin. I looked at Holmes, sitting less than a yard from me, his hand rubbed across his face in a gesture of fatigue. But for the briefest fraction of an instant, his eyes slid sideways to meet mine with a spark of hard triumph, and then his hand fell away from features that were merely bone-tired and filled with defeat. He leant back in his chair with his long bony hands spread out on the table before him and gave a tiny shrug. I have no questions, Miss Donlevy. The gun wavered for a moment. No questions? But of course you have. She caught herself. Mr. Holmes, you needn't try to irritate me. That would be a waste of our precious time. Now come, surely you have questions. Her voice had an edge to it, and a flash of memory came of a time when I had failed to make a logical connection that ought to have been obvious, and her voice had cut deep. In perfect counterpoint came the voice of Holmes, fatigued and slightly bored. Miss Donlevy, I tell you there are no questions in my mind regarding this case. It has been very interesting, even challenging, but it is now over and all the significant data have been correlated. Indeed. Pardon me if I doubt your word, Mr. Holmes, but I suspect you are playing some obscure game. Perhaps you might be so good as to explain to Miss Russell and myself the sequence of events. Hands on the table, Mr. Holmes. I have no wish to cut this short. Thank you. You may proceed. Shall I begin with the occurrences of last autumn, or of twenty-eight years ago? As you wish, though perhaps Miss Russell may find the latter course of some interest. Very well. Russell, twenty-eight years ago, I, not to mince words, killed Professor James Moriarty, your mass tutor's father. That it was self-defence does not contravene the fact that I was responsible for his falling to death over the Reichenbach Falls, or that it was my investigation into his extensive criminal activities that was the direct cause of his seeking to kill me. I found him out. I exposed his network of crime, and I was the immediate cause of his death. However, Russell, I made two mistakes at that time. Though how I might have anticipated events, I cannot at the moment think. The first was that my subsequent three-year-long disappearance from England allowed the scattered remnants of Moriarty's organization to regroup. By the time I returned, it had succeeded in extending itself internationally, with little structure left above ground in this country. My second mistake was to allow Moriarty's family the existence of which was one of his better-kept secrets, to disappear from my view. His wife and young daughter left for New York, never to be seen again. Or so I had thought. Was Don Levy your mother's maiden name? Ah, so you do have a question. 
Yes, it was. Minor lacunae, Miss Donlevy, and hardly worth the effort of pursuit. What does it matter whether the hair you left for me to find was your father's, or which room in the warehouse across the river the marksman was in before shooting at Miss Russell? Or indeed, was it you or some minion who prematurely triggered the bomb that killed Dixon? Peripheral matters left unanswered make for an untidy case, but hardly affect its basic framework. An interesting statement from a man who bases his investigations on minutiae, she commented with some justification, but we'll let it pass. Yes, it was my father's hair, from the days when he wore it down to his collar. My mother kept it in a locket, this locket I wear, in fact. And yes, my friend with the accurate rifle was indeed in the warehouse, although I understand that Scotland Yard is still looking for the launch. How they can imagine that anyone could aim from a boat on water and achieve any degree of accuracy. And as for Dixon, he knew the risks when he signed on. I was angry with him for making such a mess of the bomb that incapacitated you, and it made him clumsy. I was generous with his family's compensation. You will give me that. What price a man's life, Miss Donlevy? How many guineas is recompensed to a widow, three fatherless children? His voice hardened. You killed him, Miss Donlevy. Yourself or one of your hired thugs, who heard your anger and took it as command. You intended him dead when you opened the New York bank account from which he was paid last November, and he is now dead. We sat in utter silence, and my heart beat ten, eleven times before she responded, with grudging admiration and a touch of amusement and sounding again like herself. Mr. Holmes... How generous is the urge to Christian forgiveness in your soul, to perceive the man who nearly killed you and your two closest associates as a poor fellow whose widow and children weep for him. John Dixon was a professional, madam, an artist with fuse and explosive. He never killed, and only once injured in his entire career, until you brought him out of retirement. I can only assume you held something over him, some threat to his family, I imagine, to force him to engage in wholesale slaughter. Do not play games with me, madam, with your accidents and your shows of pique. My patience has its limits. The room's silence was so heavy I was sure she would hear my heart rate accelerate when I saw the end of the gun sag slightly away from me. He had her complete attention now. In a minute, her voice came from the dark corner, flavoured with what sounded like respect. I can see that with someone like you about, a person would never become complacent. You are quite correct. I suppose I did want him dead and tidied out of the way. His affection for those poisonous children of his was a weakness, and he would have exposed me when he had the chance. Ah, well. Introspection has never been one of my strong points. I have an unfortunate tendency to overlook side issues when I have a girl before me. As Miss Russell could tell you, I think. The silver muzzle was again aimed directly at me, and I willed my muscles to relax, cursing inwardly. We were all silent for a long minute, too, and when she started again, I knew that Holmes had miscalculated, that his successful gambit had, instead of distracting her, only driven her more strongly into asserting her domination over him. I could have told him, but he could not have known. Her counter-move was vicious and calculated to take him at his weakest point, where pride met aloof independence. I believe... She said slowly, and again she had fluctuated into that slightly off manner that made me feel as if I did not know her in the least. I believe that I shall call you Sherlock. An awkward name, that. What was your father thinking? 
Nonetheless, we have had such an intimate relationship, admittedly one-sided up to now for so many years. I believe it is time to make it reciprocal. You will address me, please, by my Christian name. Before she reached the end of this bizarre little speech, I knew what the strong sense of wrongness was that I had sensed in her. When I had known her at Oxford, she had struck me as a person whose frustrations with the demands of university life would cause her, before too long, to make a break with the university and go elsewhere to exercise her considerable abilities. Indeed, that is what I had half assumed had taken place when she did not return for Hillary term. It was now clear that the break had taken place, but internally, the tightly controlled impatience she had always exhibited had broken free, and the knowledge of her superiority had progressed to a sense of supremacy. Eccentricity had flowered into madness. It was an almost textbook illustration of dementia, but I needed no book to tell me what my crawling skin knew. The woman was more dangerous than her gun, as volatile as petrol fumes and malignant as a poisonous spider. My frantic thoughts could find no option to grab hold of, could conceive of no way to calm her or even distract her. I could only sit, still and unimportant to one side, and leave the field to Holmes's vast experience. Madam, I can hardly think that... You ought to think very carefully, Sherlock, before you choose. I had heard that tone of voice before, on occasions when her reiterated query as to whether I was satisfied with my solution had sent me scrambling for my error before she came down on me like a barbed whip. Holmes either did not perceive the threat or chose to ignore it. Miss Donlevy, I... The gunshot exploded into the closed room at the same instant that something tugged gently at my upper arm and a piece of equipment disintegrated noisily on a shelf next to the door and I just had time to hope fervently that Mrs. Hudson would not be brought in by the noise when the pain flared. Holmes heard my gasp and turned to me as I clamped my left hand over the wound. Russell, are you... She is fine, my dear Sherlock. And I suggest that you sit quietly, or soon she will not be at all fine. Thank you. I assure you that I hit precisely what I intend to hit with this gun. I do nothing by halves, and that includes target practice. And incidentally, you need not worry that your guard will interrupt us this evening. He and Mrs. Hudson are both sleeping very soundly. Now take your hand away, my dear, and let us see how much you are bleeding. You see? Barely a nick. A pretty shot, I think you'll agree. You know, she said in another voice entirely, that of a woman of reason and compassion. I am really terribly sorry that I had to do that to you, Miss Russell. I hope you realise that I am not in the habit of shooting my pupils. Her voice tried to coax a smile from me. And the terrible thing was, despite the looming panic and shock, I wanted to give it to her, wanted to trust her. Now, Sherlock, my dear, to return to the topic, what was it you were about to call me? She said in mock coquetry. Her voice set my skin to crawling. The surface was light mischief, but just below lay threat and contemptuous laughter and another thing that took me a minute to recognise. A coarse, sly tone of intimacy and seduction from a female completely sure of her power. It made me want to vomit, and then it began to make me angry. With the anger grew control. I am waiting, Sherlock. The gun jiggled slightly on her knee. Holmes's response landed in the room like a glob of spit. Patricia! That's better. We need to work on the intonation, but that will come. 
As I was saying, I feel that I know you very, very well by now. Do you realize that you have been my hobby since I was 18? Yes, quite some time now. I was in New York. My mother was dying, and in the newsstand outside the hospital I saw a copy of a journal with your picture on the front and inside a story of how you had not died, but how instead you had murdered my father. It took my mother a long time to die, and I had many hours to think about how I should meet you one day. I inherited my father's business, you know, though I was really more interested in pure mathematics than the organization. It ran itself, really, while I went to school. My managers were very loyal. Still are, for that matter. Most of them. They occasionally consulted me at university, but for the most part I would tell them what to do and they would work out the how. Sometimes I made requests, which they carried out most efficiently. Such as the unfortunate accidents that befell two of the other tutors shortly before you were hired? I blurted out, unthinkingly letting loose a snatch of remembered conversation. I felt Holmes tighten disapprovingly beside me and kicked myself mentally for drawing her attention. So you heard about that, Miss Russell? Yes, unlucky, weren't they? Still, I had the job I wanted. The job my father had been cheated out of. And I could get on with my hobby. I collected every word written by or about you. I even have an autographed copy of your monograph on bicycle tyres, one that you presented to the police commissioner. I assure you, I value it more highly than he did. Over the years, I have learned everything about you. I located three of your London hideaways, though I suspect there's at least one other. The one with the vernet is quite nice, she said casually, though the carpet leaves something to be desired. She waited for a reaction, and getting none, went on in irritation. Billy was too easy to find, and following him that night you went to the opera was child's play. I had thought of using him against you, blackmailing him concerning certain incidents in his sister's past, but it seemed cheating somehow. Again the pause. Again no response. Yes, there is very little I do not know about you, Sherlock. I know about why Mrs. Hudson's son emigrated so hastily to Australia, about you and the Adler woman after my father's death about the scar on your backside and how you came to have it. I even have a rather fetching photograph of you emerging from the steam rooms at the Turkish bathhouse on... Ha! Huh. That reached you, didn't it? She crowed at Holmes's faint exclamation and drove it home. I even bought the farm up the hill from you several years ago, through an employee, of course, so I might look down upon you even through your bedroom window. However, Holmes had recovered from his lapse, and she abandoned the attempt to goad him. It took me five years to bring seven of my employees into the area, but I enjoyed every move. And then, oh, the delicious irony of it, your Miss Russell came to me for tutoring. I could not have asked for a more perfect gift. My own intimate link with the mind of my father's murderer. Had I taken up residence in the corner of your sitting room, I could not have learnt more about you than I did from Miss Russell. It was truly delicious. During the summer holidays, I generally spent time with the business just to keep my hand in. This last summer, we decided to follow up a rumour that an important American senator was about to place himself in a remote area, so we borrowed his daughter. As you know, we were not entirely successful. But imagine my pleasure when I realised that you too were on the same job, albeit from the other end. It was almost worth the failure, having that piquant extra, a chance to meet, as it were, to work together. 
From that fiasco came my plan. I decided to kidnap Miss Russell, take her to a place where you would not find her, and play with you in public over a prolonged period of time. I laid plans. I bought clothing for her in Liverpool. Quite adequate clothing, you will agree, though I gather she did not make use of the things. Pity. One of my lighter-fingered employees removed a pair of shoes from her rooms, mostly to underline the parallelism of the two kidnap cases. Ah, I see you missed that point. How disappointing. I planned to take her at the end of term so my absences might not cause undue comment. It was extremely disconcerting, listening to her talk about me in this matter-of-fact manner. But I did not react. I was disappearing from her sight now, becoming a third-person reference. My right arm throbbed, and the fingers of that hand were tingling mildly. Then in late October, everything changed. My doctor told me that I should be dead in a year, and I was forced to review my plans. Did I truly want to embark on a complex and physically demanding project, one that might take six or eight months to do properly, and should involve regular travel to some godforsaken place like the Orkneys? I decided reluctantly to simplify matters. I could not bring myself to forego the pleasure of a cat-and-mouse game, but I decided at the end of it I should merely kill you all and have done with it. If I could make public your failure to escape me, so much the better. I had little to lose, after all. By the end of term, everything was in place. I arranged my medical leave, from which I will not return. Hired Mr. Dixon, and just before I left Oxford, laid some of my father's mathematical exercises in front of Miss Russell. The next few days were marvellous. They truly were like a complex equation falling into place. I was, as I said, really most annoyed at Mr. Dixon for knocking you about so thoroughly, and had to delay Miss Russell's bomb for a day until I could be sure you were up to defusing it. Then I sat back to see which of your paths I would pick you up on first. I did not need Dr. Watson, though that was amusing, was it not? Doddering old fool. I had a boy watching your brother's rooms all day, and I knew you were there before you went through the door. The next day I gambled, after you succeeded in throwing off my men, but I put my money on Billy and it paid off. He led us straight to you, and carried on a tedious conversation with me until he fell asleep. I was sorry about your clothes, Miss Russell. They must have cost a goodly percentage of your allowance. The money was mine, actually. Holmes volunteered. I felt her eyes leave me and return to him. Well, that's all right, then. Did you enjoy my little game in the park? Your articles on footprints were most instructive and helpful. It was very clever, Holmes said coldly. It was very clever, she prompted. He spoke through clenched jaws, to my relief. I had begun to think his anger genuine. It was very clever, Patricia. He spat. Yes, wasn't it? But I was most upset when you disappeared on that damnable boat. Really very angry indeed. Do you know what it cost me to keep an adequate watch on the docks? To say nothing of the other ports? I was certain you would come back into London, and instead weeks went by without a sign. My managers were disturbed at the expense. I had to get rid of two of them before the others would calm themselves. And the time, my valuable time, lost. Finally you came back, and I could not believe it when my man reported how you looked and behaved. I actually took the risk of coming down here to see for myself, and I admit, I fell for it. I did not think that it could be an act. Oh, on your part, yes, that I would have believed. But I did not expect that Miss Russell was capable of that quality of performance. It's a far cry from dressing up as a gypsy girl and slurring your speech. 
It was not until you both came through that door that I knew for certain it was bogus. Her voice had become increasingly hoarse, and the gun had drooped casually to one side as she talked. Holmes and I remained still, he with a look of polite boredom on his face that must have been infuriating, I trying to look young and stupid. The blood had stopped dripping onto the tiles, though my right hand was a bit numb. When Don Levy spoke again, her voice cracked slightly with tiredness. I waited, invisible, for Holmes to make me an opening. Which brings us to the present, Sherlock, my dear man. What do you think I've come for? His response was uninterested, obedient, insulting. You wish to crow over me like a cock on its dung heap. Patricia! The gun rose in threat. Patricia, my dear. His sardonic voice turned it into a sneer. To crow over you, I suppose, is one way of putting it. Nothing else. To humiliate me, preferably in some public manner so as to revenge your father. Excellent. Now, Miss Russell, do you see the envelope on the shelf to your right? The top one. Stand up and get it, please. Slowly now, remember. All right. Take it back to the table and place it in front of Sherlock. Sit down. Hands on top of the table. Good. This document is your suicide note, Sherlock. Rather lengthy, but that cannot be helped. If you are curious, the machine it was typed on is downstairs, substituted for your own. Read it by all means, and lay it in front of Miss Russell if you wish her to see it. You will not touch it, Miss Russell. One never knows how clever the fingerprint people have become, and it would not do to have your fingerprints on such a highly personal document as this. Please, dear Sherlock, you must read it. I am really quite pleased with the effect it produces, if I do say so myself. Besides that, you must never sign any document until you've read it. She laughed merrily, and the madness rang clearly from her. It was, as she said, a suicide letter. It began by stating that he, Sherlock Holmes, being in his right mind, could simply no longer see any point in staying alive. And it went on to elaborate the reasons. My rejection of him and the ensuing depression it caused was so vehemently denied as to underline my absence as the chief cause of his decision, though I personally was carefully removed from blame. Then the letter launched into a long, rambling, detailed explanation of how the cases, as recorded by Dr. Watson, had been so entirely wrong. Seventeen cases in all were presented with microscopic attention, pointing out in each one where the credit for its solution had in reality lain, usually with the police, occasionally elsewhere, several times by Holmes accidentally stumbling on the answer, once with Watson. Page after page of it we read, and she sat. Finally came the murder of Moriarty where it was revealed that the entire story was a deliberate fabrication against an inoffensive professor who had stolen the young woman Holmes desired, and whom Holmes had then hounded to his death by the creation of a totally imaginary crime syndicate. The document ended with an abject apology to the memory of a great man so badly wronged, and to the population in general who had been so misled. It was an extremely effective piece of writing. The reader was left with a clear impression of a badly unbalanced, severely depressed, drug-ridden egotist who had destroyed careers and lives in order to build his reputation. The simple white sheets with their lines of print, were they ever to get before the public, would create a huge scandal and very possibly turn the name of Sherlock Holmes into a laughingstock and the object of scorn. I sat back shaken. You have a definite flair for fiction writing, said Holmes, his voice cold with revulsion. But surely you cannot believe I might sign the thing. If you do not, I shall shoot Miss Russell, then I shall shoot you, and one of my employees will forge your signature to it. 
It will appear to be a murder-suicide and will take Miss Russell's name down with yours. And if I do sign it? If you do sign it, I shall allow you to give yourself one final injection, one that will prove fatal even for a man of your inclinations. Miss Russell will be taken away and released after the newspapers have found your letter. She has no proof, you see. None at all. And I shall be far away. You would give me your word that no harm should come to Miss Russell? He was quite serious. Even I could see that. Holmes, no! I cried appalled. You will give me your word? He repeated. You have my word. No harm will come to Miss Russell while she is in my care. No, for God's sake, Holmes. My attempt at lying invisibly in wait was shattered. Why on earth would you believe her? She'd shoot me as soon as you were gone. Miss Russell, she protested, affronted. My word is my honour. I paid Mr. Dixon his fee posthumously, did I not? And I support that other worthless family while my employees imprison. I even sent that messenger lad who delivered the clothing his second guinea. My word is good, Miss Russell. I believe you, Patricia. Why, I don't know, but I do. I am going to take my pen from my inner pocket, he said, and with slow and deliberate movements did so. I watched in horror as he uncapped it, turned to the last page of the sheaf of papers, and put the pen to the paper. Anticlimactically, the thing refused to write. He shook it without success and looked up. I'm afraid the pen is dry, Patricia. There is a bottle of ink in the cupboard above the sink. There was a moment's hesitation as she looked for a trick, but he sat patiently with the pen in his hand. Miss Russell, you get the ink. Holmes, I... Now stop snivelling, child, and get the ink, or I shall be tempted to put another hole in you. I stared at Holmes, who looked back at me calmly, one eyebrow raised slightly. The ink, please, Russell. Your two tricks appears to have us in a position of checkmate. I pushed my chair back abruptly to hide my surge of hope and went to fetch the bottle. I put it on the table in front of Holmes and took my seat. He pushed the paper away, unscrewed the top of the squat ink bottle, drew the ink up into his pen and cleared the nib of excess ink by pulling it, first one side and then the other, against the glass rim of the bottle. He then laid the pen on the table, screwed down the lid, put the bottle to one side, picked up the pen again, pulled the final sheet of typescript back in front of him held the pen over the paper and paused. You know, of course, that your father also committed suicide. What? Suicide, he repeated. He capped the pen absently and laid it on the table in front of him, picked up the ink bottle and fiddled with it for a moment, deep in thought laid it aside and leant forward on his elbows. Oh, yes, his death was suicide. He followed me to Switzerland after I destroyed his organisation, arranged a meeting at the most solitary spot he could find and came to meet me. He knew he was no match for me physically, yet he did not bring a gun. Odd, don't you think? Furthermore, he arranged for a confederate to fling rocks at me afterwards, because he suspected that he would not take me with him into death. No, it was suicide, Patricia. Quite clearly suicide. In the course of this speech, his voice had grown harder, colder, and his lips curled over her name as if he were pronouncing an obscenity. The relentless cadence of his words went on and on. You say you have come to know me, Patricia Donlevy? 
He spat out her name and wrapped it in scorn, facing her across the table. I know you too, madam. I know you for your father's daughter. Your father had a superb mind, as do you. And as you did, he left the world of honest thought and turned to the creation of filth and evil. Your father created a network of horror and depravity that exceeded anything these islands had ever before known. A web woven of all that the world of crime has to offer. His agents, employees, as you call them, robbed and murdered, drained families through blackmail, and poisoned men and women with drugs. Nothing was too squalid for your father, Patricia Don Levy, from smuggling and opium to torture and prostitution. And all the time, ah, uh, the perverted, filthy genius of it, all the time the good professor sat in his book-lined study and kept his delicate hands clean of it. Nothing touched him, not the agony or the blood or the stink of terror that spread out from his agents. Just like you, madam, he was touched only by the profits of all that sordid purulence. And he bought his wife pretty dresses and played mathematical games with his little daughter in the drawing room. Until I came along. I, Sherlock Holmes with my meddlesome ways. I carved the network into many small pieces and I turned the name Moriarty into a term of derision so that even his daughter will not carry it openly. And finally, when there was nothing left of his life, when I had driven him into a corner from which he could not escape, I pushed him over the Reichenbach Falls and he died. Your father, Patricia Don Levy, was a festering sore eating into the face of London, and I shall... With a shriek of animal fury she broke. The gun rose and swung up to face Holmes, and I, my useless right hand lying limp on the table, picked up the heavy bottle of ink and threw it hard and straight at her hand. The room was split again by a flash and deafening report, and the gun flew spinning against the wall. She came out of the dark corner in a dive for the pistol and reached it a moment, just an instant, before I hit her in a massive launch tackle that sent us crashing into the shelves, showering us with books and bottles and pieces of equipment. She was immensely strong in her madness and rage, and she had the gun in her hand, but I held her down with my entire body, and my hand hung with all its strength onto her wrist to turn the weapon away from Holmes, slowly, so slowly against her impossible strength. And then came a confused jumble of impressions, of something slipping and my left hand holding a hot, empty palm, just as a third and completely deafening explosion went off beside my head, and the shock of it went through me like a physical jolt. She stiffened beneath me in a curious protest, and coughed slightly, and then her right arm went limp, and her left hand came down across my back. I lay stunned in her embrace for a moment, until my eyes focused on the gun, inches away from her arm, and I pushed the gun hard away from me so she could not reach it, and then thought, Oh, my God, where had her second shot gone? And turned to see that Holmes was unhurt, but something was wrong. Something was suddenly very wrong with my right shoulder. And then, finally, the pain came the immense, overwhelming, shuddering roar of pain that built and beat at me, and I flung out my hand to Holmes and cried aloud as thunder filled my ears, and I slid down into a deep well of black velvet. Postlude Putting Off the Armour Chapter 19. Return Home Most creatures have a vague belief that a very precarious hazard, a kind of transparent membrane, divides death from love. Endless hours, what seemed weeks, washed in a sea of dark, muttering confusion, a labyrinth of blurred images and disconnected snatches of voices, speech from the other side of an invisible wall. 
the dream without end, horror without an awakening, casting about for solid ground only to be caught up again by the pain and flung back into the roaring, hissing blackness. My brother's rumpled hair framed by the car window. Patricia Don Levy, gaunt and sick, lying in the spreading lake of incredibly red blood. A beaker of liquid copper sulphate, smashed bilious green and dripping slowly from the workbench above me. Don Levy again, standing above my hospital bed and offering to throw me from a cliff. Holmes, so still on the laboratory's tile floor, one lonely hand curled about his head. Cold and fever burned me, and I lay consumed by a universe of shivering nightmares. Slowly, stubbornly, my body began to reassert itself. Slowly the fever burnt itself out, flickered and died. Gradually the drugs were cut back, and late one night I swam up towards rationality to lie on my back looking incuriously up into the room from a point just below the surface. A thin shimmering film was fixed between me and the painted white ceiling, the white tile walls, the machinery above my head, the pair of grey eyes that looked calmly, quietly at me. I floated closer, bit by bit, and finally the bubble softly burst. The thin membrane collapsed, I blinked. Holmes, my lips said, though no sound entered the room. Yes, Russell. The eyes smiled. I watched them for several minutes, remotely aware that they were somehow important to me. I tried to reconstruct the circumstances, and though I could remember the events, their emotional overtones seemed, in retrospect, excessive. I closed my heavy-lidded eyes. Holmes, I whispered. I am glad you're alive. I slept and woke again to find the morning sun blazing painfully through the window. The fuzzy glare was broken in several places by darker shapes, and as I squinted at them a figure moved to the source of the light, and there was a swish of curtains being drawn. With the room now at a tolerable level of dimness, I could see Holmes standing on one side of the bed and a white-coated stranger on the other. White coat laid firm, gentle fingers along the inside of my wrist. Holmes bent forward and settled my glasses onto my nose, then sat on the edge of the bed so I could see him. I could not move my head. He had shaved that morning, and I could see in intricate detail the pores of his hollow cheeks, the soft, powdery quality of the skin around his eyes a slight sag to his features that told me he had not slept in some considerable time. But the eyes were calm, and a faint hint of a smile lay at the corner of his expressive mouth. Miss Russell, I took my eyes from Holmes and looked at the doctor's earnest young face. Welcome back, Miss Russell. You had us worried for a while, but you're going to be fine now. You have a broken collarbone, and you lost a great deal of blood. But other than one more scar for your collection, there will be no lasting effect. Would you care for some water? Good. The sister will help you. Just a bit at a time until you get used to swallowing again. Mouth tastes better now? Fine. Mr. Holmes, you may have five minutes. Don't let her talk too much. I shall see you later, Miss Russell. He and the nurse went out, and I heard his voice going down the hallway. Well, Russell, our trap caught its prey, but it nearly took you with it. I had not intended quite such a generous sacrifice. I licked my dry lips with a thick tongue. Sorry. Too slow. You hurt? By no means. You reacted as quickly as I thought you might. Had you been slower, her bullet might indeed have seriously disarranged my insides. But thanks to your father's ideas concerning women on the cricket field, your good left arm saved me from anything more than a bruised rib and a missing flap of skin the size of your finger. I am the one to apologize, Russell. 
Had I been faster to my feet, the gun would not have gone off at all, and you would have an intact collarbone, and she would be sitting awaiting charges. Dead? Oh, yes, very. I shan't trouble you with the details now, because the white-coated people would not be happy if I raised your pulse. But she's dead, and Scotland Yard is happily rooting about in her papers, finding things that will keep Lestrade busy for years, to say nothing of his American colleagues. That's right. Shut your eyes for a while. It is bright in here. His voice faded. Sleep now, Russ. I shan't be far away. The hard hospital bed rose up and wrapped itself around me. Sleep now, my dear Russell. Low voices woke me in the afternoon. The room was still dim, and my shoulder and head throbbed beneath the stiff dressings. A nurse bent over me, saw that I was awake, thrust a thermometer into my mouth, and started doing other things to various parts of me. When my mouth was free again, I spoke. My voice sounded strange to my ears, and the pull of muscles sent twinges into my collarbone. The routine was all too tediously familiar. A drink, please. Certainly, miss. Let me raise the bed for you. The low voices had stopped, and as she cranked the handle, my field of vision gradually dropped from the ceiling above the bed to include the bed itself and my visitors rising from their chairs in the corner. The nursing sister held the glass for me, and I pulled methodically at the straw, ignoring the hurt of swallowing. More, miss? Uh, not now, thank you, sister. Right-o. Ring if you need me. Ten minutes, gentlemen, and see you don't tire her. Uncle John, your moustache is almost back to normal. Doddering old fool. Hello, dear Mary. You're looking a sight better than you were three days ago. They're good doctors here. And Mr. Holmes, I am happy to greet you more civilly than the last time we met. Mycroft's expression of jovial bonhomie seemed faintly menacing. Please, Miss Russell. I hardly think the formality is necessary or even appropriate. What with being welcomed into your boudoir and all. The fat face smiled down at me, and I felt so tired. What were they doing here? Brother Mycroft, then. And Holmes? You have had a rest since the morning, I think. You look not so strained. I have. There is a vacant room next to yours, and I have made use of it. How are you feeling, Russell? I am feeling as though a large piece of lead passed through me and took a considerable quantity of myself with it. How do the white coats say I am? Why didn't they go? Perhaps it is the painkillers dulling my interest. Watson cleared his throat. The bullet passed through the back of your neck, missing the spinal column by... by enough. It did go through your collarbone and nick various blood vessels before leaving the front of your shoulder and continuing on to lodge finally in Miss Dunleavy's heart. The surgeons have pieced together the clavicle, though there is considerable damage to the muscles in that area, and his face prepared me for a feeble attempt at a joke to cheer the patient. I fear you will never care to dress in anything other than high-necked clothing, though I think you had already resigned yourself to that. Where on earth did you pick up all that scar tissue? Oh, Watson, I think... Holmes began. No, Holmes, it's all right. I was so utterly weary, and Watson was peering down into my face with what I supposed was loving concern, so I closed my eyes against the brightness. It was an accident some years ago, Uncle John. Ask Holmes to tell you the story. I think I'll sleep for a while now, if you don't mind. They filed out, but I did not sleep. I lay and felt the fingers of my unresponsive right hand and thought about the walls of Jerusalem and what my mathematics tutor had taken from me.
I was in that hospital for many days, and a degree of movement gradually returned to my arm and neck. I could not abide the thought of my aunt, and indeed, after I was conscious, I refused to have her in my room. After some discussion, it was arranged that I go home to the spare room in Holmes's cottage, to the great delight of Mrs. Hudson, and the concern of the hospital authorities, who disliked the distance, the remoteness, and the poor road I should have to travel. I told Holmes I wished to go with him, and let him fight it out for me. Once there, I ate obediently, slept. "'sat in the sun with a book and worked at restoring strength to my hand. "'But it was an emptiness. "'I did not dream, though often during the day I would find "'that I had been staring off into the distance, unblinking for great chunks of time. "'When I had been in the cottage for two weeks, "'I went to the laboratory and stood looking at the clean floor and the restored shelves. "'I touched the two bullet holes in the walls.' and felt nothing but a vague unease. I could only think how bare and cold the tile looked. Summer wore on, and my body gained strength, but there were no suggestions that I moved back to my own farm. Holmes and I began to talk, short, tentative discussions about Oxford and my reading. He was away a great deal, but I did not ask why, and he did not tell me. One day I came into the sitting-room and saw the chess set laid out on a side-table. Holmes was working at his desk and looked up to see me standing there with what must have been an expression of extreme loathing on my face as I stared at those thirty carved figures, the salt cellar and the nut and bolt king on their teak and birch squares. I turned on him. For God's sake, Holmes, haven't you had enough chess for one lifetime? Put it away, get rid of it. If you wish me to leave your house, I will, but don't ask me to look at that thing. I slammed out of the room. Later in the afternoon, I came back through to see its box and board sitting closed up but still on the table. I said nothing, but avoided that part of the room. They remained on the table. I remained in the cottage. I began to find Holmes more and more irritating. The smell of his pipe and the odours from his laboratory plucked at raw nerves, and I retreated outside or behind the closed bedroom door. His violin sent me on walks into the downs that left me trembling with exhaustion, but I did not go back to my house. I began snapping irritably at him, but his response was invariably reasonable and patient, which only made me worse. Rage began to stir but lacked the consummation of open battle, for Holmes would not respond. In the last week of July, I made up my mind to leave the cottage, gather my belongings, and return to Oxford next week. Into this state of mind fell a letter. I was outside on a hilltop away from the cottage, a forgotten book in my lap as I stared out across the channel. I did not hear Holmes come up behind me, but suddenly there he was, his tobacco smell and his gently sardonic face. He held out the envelope between two long fingers and I took it. It was from little Jessica, addressed in her childish printing. I had a quick image of her bent over the envelope with a pencil in her small hand, laboriously copying my name. I smiled, and it felt strange on my lips. I took out the single sheet of stationery and read the child's words aloud. Dear Sister Mary, how are you? My mamma told me a bad lady hurt your arm. I hope it's all right now. I am fine. Yesterday a strange man came to the house, but I held mamma's hand and I was brave and strong like you. I have bad dreams sometimes and even cry. But when I think of you carrying me down the tree like a mamma monkey, I laugh and go back to sleep. Will you come to see me when you are better? Say hello to Mr. Holmes for me. I love you, Jessica Simpson. Brave and strong like me, I whispered, and started to laugh. A sour, bitter sound that tore my throat and sent pain shooting through my shoulder. And then it turned to tears, and I cried. 
and when I was empty I fell asleep in the simple sunshine as Holmes stroked my hair with his gentle, clever hands. When I awoke the sun was lower in the sky and Holmes had not moved. I turned awkwardly onto my back to ease my shoulder and looked up at the bowl of the sky. Holmes reached for his pipe and broke the silence. I need to go to France and Italy for six weeks. I shall be back before your term begins. Would you care to come with me? I lay watching his fingers fill the pipe, tamp down the black shreds of leaf, strike a flame, draw it down into the bowl. The sweet smell of burning tobacco drifted across the hillside. I smiled to myself. I believe I shall take up smoking a pipe, Holmes, for the sheer eloquence of the thing. He looked at me sharply, and then his face began to relax into the old attitude of humour and intelligence. He nodded once, as if I had given an answer, and we sat watching the sun change the colour of the sea and sky until the wind came up. Holmes knocked his pipe out against the sole of his shoe, stood up and reached down to help me rise. Let me know when you're ready for a game of chess, Russell. Twenty minutes later we came to his hives, and he went down the road to check them while I stood and watched the last workers come home with their loads of pollen. Holmes came back and we turned toward the cottage. I'll even spot your piece, Russell. But not a queen. Oh, no. Never again. You're far too good a player for that. We'll start equal, then. I shall beat you if we do. I don't think so, Holmes. I really don't think you will. The cottage was warm and filled with light and smelt of tobacco and sulphur and the food that awaited us. The End <laughs> We hope you've enjoyed the Macmillan audiobook production of The Beekeeper's Apprentice. Text copyright 1994 by Laurie R. King. Production copyright 2014 by Macmillan Audio. All rights reserved. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.